Good evening, everyone. This is the Council of the Whole Committee meeting for Thursday, June 5th, 2008, to continue the city's discussion on the mayor's budget for fiscal year 2009. Um, all committee members are here. Apology for Councillor Stephen Hay, who is uh, at his son's graduation. And Mayor Wong is speaking at an uh, alternative graduation tonight, and she expects to be here later during this budget study session. This evening, we will hear from the Mayor's Office, and we will hear from the Human Services Department, which will include elderly services, youth and recreation, library services, and the Veterans Services Division. Uh, I'd like to say that we will continue to maintain our decorum during these sessions as we have over the past two weeks. Uh, and I would first like to ask uh, Mr. Ken Jones, who will be representing the mayor, to discuss uh, the mayor's budget. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, I think that the mayor's budget is pretty forthright with the information presented. Um, the, the staffing of the mayor's office currently consists of the mayor, the assistant to the mayor, and an administrative assistant. And the, the mission statement uh, has been provided before you in the budget. Uh, we have had slight reductions, uh, and pretty much it's uh, in our uh, expense side of it. The mayor's office uh, traditionally has uh, not had large expenses and we try to reduce it uh, a, a little bit more. Our, our fixed costs are our obvious uh, salary expenses, personal expenses. Glad to answer any questions. Questions from the councilors on the mayor's budget? Councilor DiMartino. Ken, like I have asked everybody that came before us already, is there any way that you could see, which I'm looking at this very small budget, is there any way that I can ask you, could you do more with less? Well, Council, we've actually tried to do more with less um, over the short period of time that we've been here. Uh, we've uh, done our, our best to curtail the expenses that, that we have. Um, and as you can see, what we have taken uh, out of the budget is our travel and meeting expenses. Uh, what we are personally going to uh, en endeavor to do that is some of those will be out of pocket. Uh, and we have reduced our office supplies. Our office supplies end up being pretty fixed because uh, of, of, of the minimal printing that we have to do. And our dues and subscriptions we've, we, we have reduced. I don't uh, know how much more we could actually change that budget. Um, I'm looking at the 09 budget for the mayor, and it's $60,083, and um, that's the same as it was in 08. Yes. Yours is the same. There's no changes. There's no increases at all in any of your... That's correct. Okay. Was that something that <coughs> was talked about, or is just something that's going to happen? I understand the mayor is separate because she can't get a raise unless we, we do that. But how about you, the other, yourself and the, the clerical? That is something that you have decided that is going to stay the way it is this year? Uh, yes, that's, uh, we've, we're not looking for any increases. Is uh, it because you're not that long in the job and the next year you'll be looking for an increase? Um, right now, Councillor, I would say that we would, personally, if I have to answer the question, I would, uh, I'm happy to work for the city at the current rate of pay, and I, um, we'd have to definitely look at the budget picture before I think that the mayor would anticipate any increases in our office. How would you feel if we cut the clerical staff into part-time? I think that the functions of the mayor's office would be curtailed if that were to happen. Um, we are the, the door to the city, so to speak, and uh, as you're aware from being in our office many times, 
Uh, there aren't too many quiet moments in there. It, it would, uh, of course, pose some difficulties for the office. I just thought I'd ask you, because as you know, I'm asking every department to give up a little something. Yes, Councilor. And that was where I thought that might be the cut. Thank you very much. Councilor Joseph. I guess I just want to say that I want to commend the mayor and the fact that she drives her own car back and forth to work every day. Um, it's just one of those signs that she's put up or shut up and um, she's decided that she's going to do what she's going to ask others to do. And um, so I'm glad to see that she's already working on curtailing the expenses through her own example. So that's just one way that I think that um, we need to see the leadership. Um, the way the office is set up and she's working out of a cubby hole, uh, I think that she could work out of a little bigger office and uh, still be a better proficient mayor, but I think her example on um, driving her own car back and forth to work is just one way that she's found that she can do more with less, so. Councilor Caddy. Ken, just uh, to go on page 11 under accomplishments, the institution of a citywide performance evaluation system. I didn't realize that she had that in place. Uh, you don't have to answer that tonight, but could we see some paperwork on that, please? The citywide performance evaluation system is an ongoing developing process, and um, we will be providing the paperwork to that as, as it gets fully implemented and we have that uh, in, in a measurable format. All right, so it's not completed yet. Uh, the, the institution of it is completed, but the actual, uh, the actual implementation so that it's, it's a complete document is not. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, councilors? Uh, I'll just make note that the overall budget for the mayor's office is reduced 14% uh, for FY09. Uh, one thing that uh, Councilor Caddy talked about was uh, the performance appraisals, and uh, the mayor certainly is looking for accountability, and this is something that is be, be ongoing, and uh, we want to thank you for appearing here tonight. Is that it, councilors? Yes. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Jones. Moving on to page 59 and 60 in the FY09 budget, um, I ask Ms. Joan Goodwin to sit in the hot seat and discuss the elderly services budget. Good evening, Joan. Obviously, you know my name is Joan Goodwin and I oversee the Fitchburg Senior Center, um, which is the home of the Council of um, Aging at the Armory, along with um, the home of the Veterans Association um, as of December 1st, 07. Um, the mission statement is the purpose of the center is to identify and meet the needs of our elderly population and disabled population in our community and also to develop and implement programs and services to meet the needs of our aging population in the city of Fitchburg. We're very um, proud of the fact we provide a significant information um, referral and educational information to our elderly and to disabled people um, along with continuing to advocate um, through the Executive Office of Elder Affairs and the state legislation. Um, the COA is a department of the City of Fitchburg. It's overseen by the Mayor. We also have a 12-member Board of Directors that is appointed by the Mayor. I do report to both. Um, the COA meets monthly, um, the first Thursday of every month, with an agenda that I present. Um, at this time, uh, as far as positions go, myself, the Director, um, reports to the Mayor and the COA Board. Um, I oversee the daily meal site, the March scheduling transportation system. I provide support to four clubs along with the Retired Municipal Employees Association that utilizes our hall. Um, and now obviously we have the Veterans Association um, with the completion of the elevator project that should be happening. Um, also again, I provide educational and social programming and events to elders in the surrounding community. And I do mean, um, as of recently, the town of Ashby has actually come on board and has participated down at our senior center um, as they're looking for activities to do. Um, the Armory is a wonderful community focal point, which we all know, um, that provides a great venue for all. 
Um, I have over 40 active volunteers at this time who clock in over um, 10,000 hours. Um, as you can see, for anyone who's been down there, um, I could not do it without my volunteers. Um, so my, that's my position. Um, that's paid full, completely out of the city uh, budget. Uh, following that, I have the senior clerk, who is a full-time position. Part of her salary is funded by the city, and the, her other part of the salary is funded by the formula grant. Um, she's a very integral part of our of our staff. Um, she oversees the payroll, accounts payable and receivable, invoices to the auditors, along with providing support to the volunteers um, in the kitchen, especially where we have a full meal site daily. Um, and at this time, we've been running that meal site for the last year and a half strictly on volunteers. My senior clerk plays a very big role in assisting um, in that area. Um, also, she does scheduling of out-of-town transportation. Um, Next, I have the program coordinator. Her position for this past year was also partly funded by the city and partly funded by the formula grant. I have two MART schedulers. They're both 19-hour positions. Um, they do the scheduling for transportation upstairs. Um, last year, we scheduled probably over 22,000 rides in regard to MART. Um, it's a very active and busy part of what we uh, provide to the seniors. Um, their positions are completely funded by MART at this time. Um, my accomplishments stayed within the city budget except for the telephone, which you'll see on the status C. I don't know if you have it, but I am running um, behind in that. But MART does reimburse us $135 a month for three lines at the senior center. Um, our meal site and MART scheduling has had a significant increase this year along with out-of-town transportation. Um, and we do track this with um, a system that we have at the Senior Center. Um, we've in introduced several new programs and activities this past year. I'm very proud of that, especially with the, um, the staffing pattern that we do have. Um, all of our programs at the Senior Center this past year are completely self-sustaining. So we don't rely on the city for any of our programming. Um, and Probably the other accomplishment is obviously keeping that building maintained to the best of my ability and keeping it open. So I think challenges that I see in the upcoming year, um, we are scheduled to go down to a four-day work week as far as our reduction. Um, and speaking with the Board of Directors, we'll be operating Tuesday through Friday, 34 hours a week, um, from 8 to 4.30 p.m. Um, at this time, it's, it's doable. I've been able to move some, all of my Monday programming to these um, other four days. Um, and I think we'll be okay with that. Uh, as far as venues, we will have Friday evening available if people <coughs> wanted to have venues at the Senior Center. So um, certainly I do think that my biggest challenge in the upcoming year will, keep, will be keeping the building open. But more importantly is um, especially during this fiscal difficult time. Uh, a lot of my seniors, especially my, my elder seniors who own homes in Fitchburg, are really having, um, you know, they're going to be having a hard time as far as paying for the increase with fuel, oil, um, food, that type of thing. So I, I do anticipate there'll be a lot of information and referral um, that I'll be needing to support in the upcoming months for these seniors. So thank you. Th thank you. <coughs> Counselors. Councillor Di Natale. Thank you. I have three questions. Uh, first one is, can you describe for me the function of the civilian dispatcher? Those are the two uh, MART dispatches. They work the two 19-hour positions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And what they do is they schedule transportation for the seniors. So seniors are able to call in at a scheduled time during the day, and we're able to book transportation uh, for them through MART. Okay. And my second question is, uh, is there a reason we have two half-time clerks inst instead of a one full-time clerk? Or? We don't. We have, it, it's, a, it's one position. Okay. But the way it's, it's outlined, um, half of her salary comes from the, the municipal okay. piece. The other half comes from the formula grant. Okay. Um, and my uh, last question is, um, last year it was discussed about the, the Helmi Fund. Yes. The purchase of a new senior center boiler because it's archaic, mm -hmm. and I also understand there's roof issues. Yes, there is. Um, in February, I asked that a letter be sent to the mayor asking her why we're not, ta how, how mu do we know how much Mrs. Saracen is in that fund, the Helmy fund? Yeah, Helmy Johnson, approximately $62,000. Okay. 
And do we do we have any quotes, or have we gone out to ask what it would cost for, at the very least, the roof? I, I'm assuming it's not going to cost sixty-two thousand to fix the roof. Um, I actually spoke with the commissioner today. Um, I've been, you know, trying to work to get some resolve in regard to these three issues. As far as the roof goes, nothing has moved forward as of yet. But I did address the concern with the commissioner today. What What is the process to get that money spent on that infrastructure? If we, if 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 that was the decision, is it the mayor that has to give the go ahead to have those funds released? Um, I I believe that the the board or the friends would would petition the mayor and then the mayor would get a council order that would approve the expenditures that would be approved have to be approved by the council well I would I would stress that that be brought to the commissioner's attention or to the board's attention that if that's the process or unless they've already done that actually I don't think so I think it would be the council on aging board of directors I believe the council on aging board of directors have right discussed this in the past yeah. and it's stalled somewhere so probably the Council on Aging probably would have to reaffirm their vote and then send a letter to the mayor requesting that action be taken well, if that can be relayed to them I'd appreciate it because okay. we're always talking about being on top of our capital needs Correct. we've got money sitting in there and I believe we were spending a lot of money on heat and fuel for an aging boiler and this was brought up a year ago and I think this the Council on Aging Board is is just as frustrated in well, regard to um, I don't see the, I don't see the reason for the holdup the money's there the roof needs desperate <coughs> repairs are we gonna wait till it caves in I mean I, I would stress that they reaffirm their vote and give the mayor a, you know let her realize that this was brought up over a year ago and we're spending a lot of money even on the boiler I know it can't fix the boiler and the roof but let's start with the outer area of the roof and if there's money there I don't know why we're sitting on it thank you um, mr. Saracen that money in the Helmy Johnson fund can only be <coughs> only be used for senior citizen improvements correct S I believe the related uh, uh, anything related to the senior center and I have uh, in my files uh, the ruling that uh, we received years ago from uh, city solicitor Ciota maybe 10 years ago or more than that so that did provide guidance on the use of those monies which I could I will provide the mayor with tomorrow thank you councillor caddy John where in the budget is your cost of heating that would be under <coughs> page 53 and whose budget is that I believe now it's under the a public facilities manager is it mixed in with other buildings and if, um, building repair and care you'll see um, three line items for the building maintenance page 53 which is minus 20 percent page 53 Oh, 52. 52. 52. I'm sorry. Building maintenance, senior center heat, and electricity, and there's a significant reduction there. Because heating oil's going going down. Because heating oil's going down. Um, my my question, Mr. President, revolved around this Helmy Johnson fund. Uh, the boiler we have there is so antiquated. If the monies could be spent from this fund to put in a new boiler the heating costs would go down and I think we've sat on this much too long five years since I've been here and uh, I hope that the council would would help uh, try to put some pressure on the mayor and a solicitor and try to get a new boiler installed for this winter so that our costs could stabilize in heating Thank you. Councilor Boivet. Thank you. Uh, in regard to the new roof, uh, have we ever had a, an estimate as to how much this new roof would cost? No. I, when speaking with the building commissioner today, um, he mentioned um, it would have, an architect would have to come in 
and come up with a design and plan, and I believe because of proper procurement. Am I correct, Mr. Saracen? Um, yeah, if it, I, I, I assume that's the case, and if it's under a certain amount, it's easier to uh, contract with an architect. Uh, I would think this is a smaller job, but uh, I'd have to go through, we'd have to check with Nancy also, the purchasing agent on that. The reason we have to go through an architect is for what, what purpose? If, is, is if this because of is this because of uh, uh, the law? Because it's a historical building, I believe. That's why we have to hire an architect because okay, it's I'll, on the historical register. And have we have we ever had an an estimate as to replace the boiler that we've been talking about for the past eons, as well as the roof? We've been listening to these these complaints about that roof so ever since I've been here. And uh, nothing has ever done. They put a little patch job here, a little patch job there. This does not solve a major problem. Um, I would like to find out if, if, in fact, it would be possible if we need to get an architect down there to, to get an ar architect to do so. Uh, we've got to take the first step in order to repair our buildings, or else that building will be in the same condition eventually as the, the old uh, Fitchburg uh, annex, which is condemned. Councilor, are you suggesting that a letter be sent to the mayor and the building commissioner seeking clarification on these yes. issues? Yes. We will do that. We'd like to, I would like to see something done so that, that to get the ball rolling and, 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 and get some figures together rather than sit around in all these meetings and talk about a new roof or a new boiler and we have nothing to go on. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Tran. Hi, Joe. Hi. Um, do we provide any assistance to the uh, Meals on Wheels that service the uh, seniors? No. No. Um, you you mean financial? Financially, service-wise, anything? We provide the meal site. We do. Um, every year we do get a suggested, suggested donated bill mm -hmm. from Mark, um, and it's, it's a it's a figure um, that Mark represents to us as far as how many meals have been served. Um, and it is a suggested don um, monetary gift. Now, is it true that the funding for that service has decreased? What happened was um, a month and a half ago, Mark was also um, dealing with some financial situations. And what they did was they took the um, the home meals and they brought it down to three days a week but they mm -hmm. also made sure that these people who were homebound and got the meals had an extra meal put in their freezer or in a cooler so this was just until the end of the year and I believe you know as of July 1st their fiscal new year they'll be back to doing the five day a week delivery oh, that's but I did receive a lot of phone calls from um, concerned children with elderly mm -hmm. parents in regard to this yeah, that's, that's um, absolutely excellent to hear uh, because I was about to ask you, if <coughs> are, we, are we putting any programs together or advocating for more funding? But if that's the case, then um, I'm delighted to hear that. Yeah, I'm actually anticipating our meal site's going to grow um, quite a bit in the fall and the winter months mm -hmm. with the seniors. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Joseph. I just, um, I guess, in following the, the trail of the Helmy Fund, and uh, the, the boiler, I've talked with Mr. Gallant several times, and because of the process of the architect and all that other good stuff that we put upon ourselves as government, uh, having to go out to bid and things like that, the $60,000 doesn't come anywhere near close to what it's gonna cost us to replace the boiler and do all the, the RFPs and all the, um, get the bids and, and get the architect work done. So he's, it's not like Mr. Gallant has been just sitting on this for the last three years because I think everybody's lit in a fire under him to try and get it done, but it's just a matter of um, the additional monies that would be required in order to put a new boiler in that, that the Helmy Fund just isn't enough to cover the cost of doing that project. I guess my question is hall rental fees, mm -hmm. where, do the, where does the hall rental fees go or any monies that are made on the nights of hall the, the halls rented um, the hall rental fees go into um, the kitchen account uh, an account that um, the former mayor had us set up 
So in to date, um, we have made $5,560 in hall rental fees for this year, which um, the mayor, you know, and I spoke about this morning. Okay. So there is there are, there are monies available from the hall rental fees, but we were advised by the former administration, you know, for this account and to put the funds in there at the present time. So we do have that. I, I just find that such an enjoyable venue every time we go down there it to um, have an event. As a city council, we've had quite a few events, and plus we attend a lot of events there. And I just see that the hall should be promoted more. I mean, you've got a new sound system. Um, there should be maybe an increase in the fee, and it should be a money generator. And if that means yeah. how you're going to stay open on Monday, then that's how you stay open on Monday. But, I mean, there's got to be a way of promoting that hall um, and making sure all the fees go back into the um, running of the senior center well and that's and that's a part of my job that I've kind of picked up on is is overseeing um, the application process and the rental of the hall but um, thanks to a volunteer in particular um, he's helped me out as far as um, you know m me not being so involved in the hall rental and the bar and um, it really has been very successful this past year we've had some great venues there I know you as the council <coughs> All of you have been very supportive, and um, it does not go unrecognized down there. And I agree with you. We need to promote that hall. And I, I, it's the, when the bar is open, where do the proceeds go from the bar? The bar the, anything from the bar goes directly to the Friends of the Fitchburg Senior Center. That's their, that's their um, way of uh, raising funds. And okay. a, a member from the Friends is there at all times overseeing the bar. Okay. I just, I just like I said, I think that's a source of revenue that needs to be promoted so that we get more out of it and, and we can help keep the senior center open that one more day with some creative financing. Thank you. Councilors, before we leave uh, the Helney Fund, Mr. Saracen, how long has the city been holding that $62,000? How much interest are we getting on that, or have we got anything? We just like, have we just tossed it into an account, or no? Um, that account, uh, I re I recall the ruling very clearly. Um, that was unique. It's in the uh, in with all of the other trust funds, but the ruling we got from Attorney Ciotta is that account, because it wasn't officially a trust fund, the fund does not generate interest instead the interest goes into the city uh, under the treasurer as investment income so the city has benefited in that we have uh, received the investment income from that 62,000 all these years and I, I think that account has been around for at least 10 years I, I uh, think it's 1989 or 90 right and I, I have the, the ruling I've provided it at different times to different people so I'd just like to say it's it's a little unfortunate that we haven't been able to even install a boiler there because uh, having assisted Councillor Caddy on several of the meals that he has done over there he has indicated in the past that he'd be willing to make some personal time contributions to assisting and putting a boiler in there and and nothing has happened and he believes that that it could be done for a lot less uh, am I correct counselor yes so I think you know we really have to take a stab at a good letter and incorporate all these things to the mayor and the building uh, superintendent so that he understands what's going on over there uh, I may be wrong I don't have a, a legal degree but do we really have to have an architect to put in a boiler Councilor Salamito, you're patiently waiting over there. Thank you, Mr. President. Good one. Thank you. First of all, I'd like, I'd like to commend you how you've run that center. Uh, for the people who haven't been, they are running a program for the history of Fitchburg. It's a weekly program, and if anybody is interested in the history of Fitchburg, it is, it's fascinating to go to. It starts from the Civil War, and it goes right up. I know I've loved going. Uh, a couple of questions that I have, and it, this is going to be a, a tough question. 
and it really doesn't pertain to the senior center, but in a way it might. I've got an awful lot of calls, and I'm sure everybody has, about the library, and that's not the issue before you. But many people have called and said they would love to volunteer at the library. And I'm not an expert on volunteering and what you can do. Many of those people, thank God, have been uh, senior citizens. I don't know how we define that age, but I know I'm in it now. Um, but those people have, many people have volunteered and said, could I help out? Could I do something to help the library? Those people also said, I attend the senior center. Is there a way or do you think it's possible for the volunteers you have, and they do a lot of great work, that, that there might be a coordination with the senior center and the library to help out? And I think I'm going to ask, could the college do it down the road? Could the high school students do it down the road? But I guess you're the first one in front of us. I, I, I think with the volunteer program we have at the senior center, I think any department can be um, successful in generating volunteers. Um, people are very willing to help out. People want to help out. Um, I know I have had um, two or three volunteer programs throughout the year. Um, volunteer appreciation, um, lunches and breakfasts, but then also an opportunity for people to come in who want to volunteer. Um, and it's amazing the people who have come forward. Um, so I, I truly feel as though the library um, could take the opportunity to run, you know, to implement a volunteer program and I think it would be very successful, especially with the group of people here tonight. I think they would be pleasantly surprised as to how successful it would be for the library. I guess what I'm asking maybe, and I know and it would be great if the library could initiate a volunteer program. I guess what I'm asking, do you think any of the people who go to the senior center may want to be, be part of a volunteer program that would assist the library? And I know it's not your obligation or responsibility to keep another department open, but if the people who go to your center do want to help, and I know they do, uh, do you think there could be a coordination between the senior center and the library? I, I think there could be. I, notice, I am noticing myself just in the last year, um, my volunteers that I have currently are really aging in place, which is, you know, I'm now getting, trying to encourage newer volunteers to come in, but I do feel there would be an interest with some of my volunteers over at the center to, if they would have an interest in, in helping out at the library. Right. I mean, I think it would be great, and then if the college, maybe That's some right. um, program at the college for an internship might be able, but if each, if we could get a department here and there to chip in, and I know people would like to volunteer, it's got to be a team effort, and I know it isn't your obligation, but you do such a great job and the people there are so committed to Fitchburg. My other question is on page 58 where it has the general fund, the, the Council on Aging Personal Services, how does that connect or associate it with your, your budget or is it at all? At the very top? Yes. The Council on Aging Personal Expenses? Yes, and the personal services, one being 109000 and the other being 6900 The $6,900 is the office supplies, the telephone, um, adult education. That's what that line item includes. And the 109105 are the salaries. All right, so it isn't duplicitous at all. What it is is it's just on two pages, but you've explained it on page 60 and then it's a total budget on 58th, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, I misread it. That my question is the answer. Thank you. Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Hi, Joan. Hi. Uh, doing a fantastic job. Uh, in regards to the roof and you aren't able to, you have to get an architect because it's a historical building. Are there federal grants that are available for um, structures, historical structures, because I believe that they need to be done a certain way in order to maintain that designation. Right. Um, and I think I've heard of those types of grants before, and if they exist, have they been applied for? Well, 
the building is under Mass Historic, and they have their guidelines in regard to what can be done with the building. It's not National Historic, it's Mass, Mass Historic. This Mass Historic. Correct. Okay, because I was... And, and Commissioner Gallant is very much aware of that. Um, but I, I, feel, I believe, though, because the building is a municipal building, he does have to go through proper procurement in regard to doing anything, any kind of a project on the building. So I think initially funds need to be set aside for the design and for the, the start of the project. There's and not, I'm sorry, there's not money available um, either federally or statewide for these particular buildings that have this designation. Um, if municipalities need to go, I mean, the state's already put so much of a burden on cities and towns now. Um, I would hope that they'd be able to do a little bit more, but if they're putting this designation on buildings, <laughs> don't you think that they should have some types of programs available to maintain them so they keep this particular there are designation? There programs, and as a matter of fact, they spoke with um, a gentleman in planning in regard to that. Um, so that's something we could look into. Okay, because I mean, if we have, if we need a boiler and a roof, and we've got this money from this other um, fund that could be used for a boiler, um, I think it would be advantageous to start pursuing some more of these uh, grants in order to maintain the structures because I'm sure that they, I, I know federally they exist, I'm not sure about mass historic, but I think it's something that really should be looked into because I believe it's a need. Thank you. Councilor Caddy. Uh, I don't want to embarrass anyone. But um, you spoke earlier about a volunteer who helps you with a hall. Is that volunteer in this room? Yes, he is. How many hours do you think he volunteers in a week? He must be there, I'd say, 30 hours a week, 25 could you Could you point him out for us, please? John, John Mashudi. Thank you. He's my guy. Councilor Di Natale. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Saracen, how long has the Helmy Fund been at 62000 since it's not generating any investment interest, investment income? It actually was higher, but uh, the Council on Aging, I recall years ago, they did use some of those monies for a purpose. I don't remember what. I believe it started out at $114,000. That sounds about right. How and it doesn't it, generate it? interest, but right. the city does earn interest. It is an, it's in an interest-bearing account. Right. We get the benefit. Uh, How long has it been since we've done anything to that account since? Oh, the, the last time? Yeah, what? Um, probably eight, eight or ten years. Are there any other infrastructure needs at that building besides the roof and the boiler? The roof, the boiler, a fire alarm panel. Um, other, other, is, I probably can't name them off the top of right now, but there's other needs, though, that are critical? In, in, the, in the building? Building-wise? Yes. Those are the three. <coughs> so a fire alarm panel. I'm, I just don't want to sit on that money if, if there are things that are critical in need. And I, I was saying to myself, a boiler and a roof probably isn't going to get us by, through $60,000. I agree with that. But as Council Boyver said, let's get estimates on those things before we make those, you know, say that. And second is, if there's other needs that, that are of critical nature, then we need to tap into that. Thank you. Councilor Di Martino. Thank you. Can you explain to me what the formula grant is? The formula grant is a, is a grant um, through the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. Every single city in the state of Massachusetts <coughs> receives money from the state. That, that amount of money is determined by how many seniors live in your town or city. Um, Massachusetts is using for Fitchburg um, the number 7,020 according to the last census. So we have approximately $45,500 that we received this year in formula grant funds. Um, I anticipate um, through what I've heard with the legislation going on in Boston that that, that may increase. So. And I see that <clears throat> under the formula grant that 10,000 of that uh, went to, did that go to your, your pay? This year, um, $10,000 uh, from my salary will come out of the formula grant. Half of the clerk's salary will come out of the formula grant, and the entire program coordinator's salary will come out of the formula grant. So this year we're using probably close to $40,000 of the formula grant in salary. Okay, I also see that you got a step raise this year. Yes, that, that is. And, and 
when we when you're going back to four days which is unfortunate is happening will all of your pay be uh, prorated to the four days um, it, it's going to turn into a 34 hour work week so I have I work 37 and a half hours according to my contract well so, you work more than that but I'm just talking about the reality so um, in speaking with the mayor, I'll probably be doing a lot of outreach on the on the day off. Okay, so the, the actual numbers will stay the same. Correct. Our hours are going to extend from okay. eight to four thirty. Okay. So that's going to make up for the itself. difference. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> Councilor Clark. Thanks, Mr. President. <coughs> Joan, um, I took a tour of the building a few months ago, and um, took a look at the rooms upstairs. There are uh, several rooms up there that, um, and, and a lot of great space up there. Um, is anything being done with those rooms now, or is there any, you know, when we looked across the, at the, uh, the court building, we thought, you know, maybe somebody would want to rent a room, a lawyer or something. I mean, it's right across the street. Maybe some income for the center. Up until a year and a half ago, I was starting to investigate renting the, the rooms upstairs as office space, but that's when um, the, the former administration uh, worked with the veterans group and they're now going to be housed upstairs um, and I think once the elevator project is com complete I believe the veteran office of, in, in City Hall will be moving over. Right now we do have one office that the Mart scheduler uses and we have um, a couple more offices down at the other end but there is quite a bit of space upstairs but that, that's the plan now. Um, this organization does pay a $300 a month uh, fee for rent for the upstairs, and that started in December of 07. Okay. So that's also money that could be put towards. And they're a very enthusiastic group of men. Um, they're looking forward to coming in, and you know, I certainly believe they'll they'll be having fundraisers and be supporting us in any way they can. And would that money go into that account that you? There is, um, I believe, it's going into the general fund. Right now, I think. Ultimately, that is a goal, but I think we got to work on uh, setting up the appropriate account that would allow that to happen. A revolving account? Yes, uh, or some other. I, I think the revolving fund or account is the way to go, but we need to meet with Joan and legal and the mayor to get that squared away. Thank you, Joan. Councilor Boivet. Thank you. Uh, just to piggyback off of Councilor Clark's uh, comment, um, how, how many rooms will the uh, veteran service be using? Four. And how many rooms are there upstairs that uh, uh, are use, in use or could be used? Seven. So would it be feasible to actually rent out one or two of those rooms to, uh, uh, like Councilor Clark said, possibly lawyers uh, or what have you? Uh, would that be uh, uh, falling under your jurisdiction? Actually, I had someone who was interested in renting a room, and, and she still is available. Um, but we decided to hold off until we knew exactly what was happening with the veterans, get them settled in the second floor, and then go from there. They have been pretty much settled in, not settled in, but they, they, the, their areas have been, have been determined. <laughs> it, it, their areas are designated. Okay, so <laughs> in reality, you still have two to three rooms I that you have, can? I may have two rooms available. Could you pursue? Uh, looking to rent those homes to bring some extra income into that building? I could. <coughs> Thank you. Councilor DiMartino. Joan, I was over there today for that wonderful fair, and when I went into the kitchen, it was wonderful. There was uh, several men in there cooking a beautiful, big, huge roast beef and green beans for the veterans, and that is one of the great things that they do. They bring veterans in from other areas who would not normally have a nice evening. And they're there and they're being honored every week, every once a month, right? They're the veterans from, from Bedford. From Bedford, they come in from Bedford. And it was just wonderful to see the quality of meat. I'm actually, I was getting mouth watering of it. But as some of the, a lot of people don't realize what, what the senior center does. It does so many things. It and it's not just, any. and it you know, it's, it's there for anything that you ask for and it's, um, to go down to uh, four days, I, I find it very sad. 
because it helps veterans, it helps elderly. You do the brown bags, you do the, the I, do, I know you do the food pantry yourself. Um, I've been to you many times with people who've no food, you come out with food. It's just a wonderful place to go. And I just want to tell you that um, I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? Thank you very much, Thank Ms. You. Goodwin. We will now move to the Youth and Recreation Division. Good evening, Mr. Roy. Good evening, councillors. Page 66 and 67 in your budget. Uh, thank you, Councilors. Uh, Andy Roy, Recreation Director for the City. Uh, mission statement on uh, the Fitchburg Parks and Recreation Department uh, is as diverse as the community it serves, as in so many other aspects of life. The key to running a successful department is having the ability to strike a balance between young and old, tradition and innovation, and the needs of one versus the needs of many. Uh, our Parks and Recreation Department, we do provide essential services, facilities, and programs necessary for the pos positive development and well-being of the community through the provision of parks, greenways, trails, recreation facilities, while working in cooperation with other services, uh, service providers in the community in order to maximize all the available resources in the city of Fitchburg. Our employees continually strive to honor the past while embracing the challenges of the future and to serve the entire community while maintaining meaningful connections with individual participants. The functions of the Parks and Recreation Office under the control of the Board of Park Commissioners which is a five-member board appointed by the mayor. Uh, we serve as the manager of all public parks and playgrounds and recreational programs that the city offers through our control. Uh, our facilities are available to all the leagues in the city and patrons that wish to use them and are approved by the park board through my office. Uh, as you know, uh, the recreation department is, is staffed by myself 80% of the year, and we do get some summer help and part-time work. Uh, this year we're looking at a playground supervisor, 14 playground instructors, and two water attendants up at Park Hill. Some of the accomplishments of this last year, obviously uh, you've probably seen it, a lot of renovation work at three of our major facilities, uh, namely Coolidge, Cogsall, and Park Hill. Coolidge, we've got a lot of infrastructure work, drainage, uh, the road in there that uh, needed to be updated. You know, Cogsall, the timber management, in Park Hill, we got the new um, bike park up there as well as um, the basketball court and the, and the tennis courts. Uh, obviously, we continue professional training for our seasonal staff. Uh, we have increased our participation in most of our program, including our summer parks program. We also run Civic Day events, uh, which we know uh, everyone enjoys here in the city during the 4th of July week. Uh, we also worked on ways of increasing revenue, uh, looking into pool fees and vendor fees. Obviously, priorities this year, uh, increase advertising. It's always um, an issue getting the word out there. Uh, no matter how many avenues we go to, it seems like some people still don't get the message. Uh, we are going to look into new revenue streams, obviously, see if they're feasible. Uh, we do continue to look into grants to offset costs. Uh, we reach out to the community and offer the best programs we can. And obviously, um, we maximize our output uh, with the resources we have available. I'll take any questions. Councilor Di Natale. Mr. Roy, I just want to say uh, you're doing a wonderful job. I, I've been to Park Hill recently, and I always walk through Coolidge with my uh, family um, every chance I get. What a, what a great park that is. Um, and there's so many kids that are down there, and it's, it's being kept well so nicely. Uh, your I just want to indicate some things here. Your department's been cut 39%. Uh, you are losing all of your lifeguards, you're losing one water attendant, you're losing all of your league coordinators, and you're losing two playground instructors. With no league coordinators and no lifeguards, I assume the, co the, the pools are going to be shut for the summer? That's correct. Um, in this budget, the Coolidge pool will be closed. Now, what about the leagues? How many, how many leagues is this impacting? It will not impact any of our leagues. That is for our basketball leagues. Um, a men's league, boys and girls. That is, um, those positions are $500 stipends at the end of the year. They do get paid per game as well. It's for um, when I'm not there a lot of the uh, sometimes, which I'm there just about all the time, 
Um, they, they also write up um, the scores for me for the paper, uh, deal with uh, any problems that may arise when I'm not there. But those leagues will go on as, as they have in the past. You, I just wanted to, you know, I just hope that we can maintain as best we can the level of service to our youth in the area. And uh, because I look through this budget and every single line item probably save one or two out of 20 have been either completely eliminated or reduced by well over 40 percent. So um, that's very, very uh, disheartening to see. Thank you. Councilor Starr. President, <clears throat> first I'd like to grad congratulate you on being named City Hall Employee of the Year. I know it's uh, very well deserved. Um, having utilized probably every single park in this city, I uh, believe me, among other things, it's one of the uh, needs that we have. Um, what are the hours going to be now? I, I know we've, we've lost the pool. Um, what are the hours? plan on being for the splash park up in Park Hill? That will remain what it has been in the past seven days a week, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, how many people need to be staffed there at a time? Just one or? We have one and some days we have two. Okay. Um, are there any, do you have any numbers on um, how many <coughs> kids utilize, say, the pool that are losing those services? I know it was a mob scene during the summer. Yeah, roughly on a warm summer day, we have around 400 uh, kids down there because we have a per limit, per lifeguard, and our limit's usually around 240, and we have waiting lines most days. So that's gone for the year. Um, well, again, I think you're doing a fantastic job, and um, <laughs> having umpired your Little League games, um, known you for a long time, and I know how dedicated you are to the city, and I think you're a total <laughs> asset to the city. Thank you. Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mr. President. Andy, <clears throat> the other night at the Parks Board meeting, there was a question about uh, the cost of starting up of the pool if you were to reopen it. Um, guards, chemicals, water. So I think you said it was $60,000? Yeah, roughly for the 10-week season. For the 10-week season, $60,000. The, uh, the pool in South Fitchburg remains open. That's correct. I talked to the state today, and they will be open. And that's still being maintained by the state of Massachusetts. Right. There was some talk about the state uh, making some sort of deal with the city so the city would take over that pool. But that has been quiet. I talked to about am I looking long term. Um, the reason why we can keep the splash park open is obviously cost. Um, it's about 10 times less than the pool. A lot less liability, no chemicals, a lot less electricity. Season can be longer. Um, our attendant goes up there, turns the water on, keeps crowd control, cleans the bathrooms. End of the day, shuts off the water and leaves. We had a nice weekend in the spring. We could open it up. Nice weekend in the fall, we can close it. Uh, pool, we need eight lifeguards uh, on staff at all times. Um, I'm looking in the long term to possibly look into see if we can change over uh, the pool location into a, a bigger type of splash park for that reason. Um, obviously, we all know the budget's not getting it. Budget situation's not getting any better. Uh, pools are kind of looking a thing in the past. Um, these splash parks are more f family orientated. Um, like I said, a lot less liability. Um, and I did talk to the state about it. They've, they've already started looking into that in other cities, and um, we're going to have that discussion. I know. Your board members who are here tonight talked about that, and that <clears throat> a lot of that money was community development block grant, federal money, and um, that's something they're going to have to check on before we advance on that. Um, as one of your budget priorities, reach out to the community and offer the best programs we can. Um, sometimes I see uh, uh, groups that are fractured. I. Uh, have you ever gotten together with the, the PAL group, the public, uh, the uh, Police Athletic League, uh, relatively new, a year or two old, uh, hundreds of kids playing at the Parkinson Gym at Fitchburg State? Um, 
Uh, are you in conjunction with them? Absolutely. We, um, we offered some travel uh, league basketball teams last year with them. Um, we did a, a kickball, uh, summer kickball league through our Pox program with them. Um, as you know, we work with Fitchburg State College a lot. We work with Mock. We work with Luck. We work with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and that's what I'm talking about by uh, maximizing our output. We do work with all these um, agencies, especially during the summer. Yeah, because we do have them. I mean, we, we've got PALS. Uh, we've got the Boys and Girls Club. We've got the rec department. So it's not just the rec department handling everything. We do have these other groups. That's correct. And we do have a lot of kids involved. Yep. And it's not just basketball. It's arts and it's Absolutely. cheerleading. And it's, it, they do a whole mess of different things. So um, those programs are there for people. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilor Boave. Andy, uh, I want to congratulate you on your recent accomplishment okay. of uh, Employee of the Year. Um, I have this is this whole thing is more of a comment than 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 anything. Um, since Park Hill is in Ward Two, <coughs> up in the Claygon area, uh, I I travel through there several times a day. Sometimes um, it is it is very heartwarming to see the. <coughs> Uh, all the activities that are going on in that one park it's it's not one of the biggest parks in town but it is a very active park from the recent BMX uh, addition to uh, uh, tennis courts and basketball courts and uh, skateboard park and uh, uh, two baseball fields and other activities there at a splash park um, wonderful areas for picnics um, this park is a very difficult place to maintain and uh, my congratulations uh, to all of the, the uh, Parks Department uh, as well as the Park Commissioners uh, in maintaining not only Park Hill but the other uh, parks in the city. Uh, you guys are doing a wonderful job. Thank you. And, thank you. And, and speaking on that, if I could, I mean, it is, I mean, with all the negatives going on in the city, we do actually get some phone calls from people that have lived in the city a long time and appreciate all the activities that are going yeah. on in the parks. And I mean, they see it. Um, they, they can't believe how many kids are there. There's minimal problems. Um, Very few. Go by any of them any day and you can see that, that they're packed. Park Hill is uh, uh, very few problems down there. Um, we have a lot of dedicated, empl uh, dedicated employees naturally and, and we have other people who are watching uh, the activities going on on a daily basis. Uh, even this, even down to the, the hot dog salesman, he, he, he keeps an eye on things. So congratulations to, to all of you for a job well done. Thank you. Councilor Joseph. I mean, <laughs> accolades, I guess, are the thing of the day, but um, you, you do a great job both for young and old here in the city. It's not just the young people that benefit from the recreation department with the trips that you have planned and the things that you do to get people involved and stay active. It, it's a great thing this is the recreation department never really had before and it's really expanded to a point where it serves all the community of Fitchburg. And I guess my question is are, are we bound by some reason not to seek advertisers or something that would allow us to keep the pool open? Is there is there ways that we could get sponsors to give up $57,000 to advertise at the pools to keep the pools open. I know the school department has Channel One, or it used to. I don't know if they still do different things, but I'm sure there's healthy advertisers that would be sponsors for the swimming pool, and $57,000 is peanuts in some of these guys' pockets. If, if we Can we pursue that? Is that an avenue? I, I think we can. Um, obviously, sponsorships are, are huge with our department. I mean, if you look at any Little League or, or Babe Ruth on their fields, uh, all them signs of sponsorships, all the teams, team names, those are all sponsorship monies. Um, uh, I don't know how easy it would be to reach that amount of money, uh, but we could look into that. I mean, Nike, Reebok, all these people have swim gear, swimwear, and, and they would, you know, put an advertisement up. Uh, the, every every place you go has a TV monitor 
with a with a rolling commercial on it. You can't even go to the doctor's office without seeing all the latest developments in, in medical history in front of you while you're sitting there trying to read the great magazines they provide you. Um, but there's got to be other sponsors that or other ways. I don't know if we're bound because of the CDBG or if we could just find sponsors in the private community for $57,000 to keep our pool open. Yeah, we'll get into that. Thank you. Councilor DiMartino. I'm looking at the playground. Were ours, was there weeks cut back on the playground <laughs> program also? No, that was two positions. Oh, it was? Yeah. Okay. The pool is not just a pool. Isn't there a lunch program that goes with the pool? That's correct. That was one of our locations. Yeah, and how many lunches would you bring to that location per day? Uh, it was usually around 40. Every day. So those, there were 40 children who would have a lunch as well as play there or a swim there. Yes. How, what will happen to that p particular part of the program? I'm looking, I'm going to talk to the state about that, possibly see if we can trans transfer it over to the state pool and offer the same thing. Because you don't want them to think that we don't have those children because we still have them regardless just because it's cut back. Have, have you looked into the actual block grant program itself to see if there was any money left over from anywhere to try to at least do half of the summer with the pool? We cannot use CDBG for any staff. Staffing. Oh, you can't use it for staff? Okay. Just thought, I just thought it was an idea. Mm. Thank you very much. Councilor Di Natale. Thank you. Do, they, do your employees, the playground instructors and the lifeguards, do they get any benefits from the city? No, they do not. This, this budget, particularly losing the pool, um, upsets me greatly because it's only $50,000. $20,000 for the pool equipment and chemicals and 30000 for the lifeguards. $50,000 out of 98 plus million that we can't reallocate to keep the pool open for 400 kids. Um, there have been some suggestions that I've made on cuts. I can't promise anything nor can anybody else because the mayor ultimately has the final say on where monies can be reallocated if there are cuts. But again, looking at the grand scope of things, $99 million, 50000 to save the pool. Given the recent turn of ev recent events that we've gone through, I find it very difficult to believe we can't find 50000 to keep the pool open. Thank you. Councilor Tran. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Hi, Andy. Um, your budget is reduced by 39%. Um, can you name some of the um, programs that you're offering this summer? Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you guys all know, obviously, um, our revolving account um, makes up about 90% of our programs, which means even though we are getting cut, the main thing, the pool, we keep adding programs. Um, we already got a girls' summer softball program we're adding, adding this summer that we started last year. Um, we're starting a girls' field hockey league up at Nicodus. We're looking into a boys' lacrosse league also up at Nicodus. Uh, we're going to do AAU baseball team down at Coolidge, down a new field. Um, obviously, our youth wrestling, our basketball, uh, our walking and jogging program, swim lessons that we've done, baseball clinics, camps, our men's basketball league, our skateboard lessons, our aerobics classes, um, our holiday events, our fall baseball league, things like that you don't see in the budget because we charge a small fee and then we pay for the service. Okay, so at least we have some kind of programs that we're offering. That's correct. Um, no, it's, it's unfortunate that we have people in this community that do not believe that we should provide any kind of recreational programs to our children. And, um, you know, needless to say, these are the same people who want to close the library completely. So, um, you know, some of my colleagues mentioned the pool and I think it's important that um, you look into um, finding some kind of a private funding to see if we can open up that pool, or at least maintain that pool, because in the long run, it's going to cost us a lot of money to go back and try to fix that pool and open it up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wright, on the um, improvements that have been made and are being made at Coolidge, are those being funded 100% by CDBG money? That's correct. And urban self-help. Actually, uh, it was $500,000 grants from urban self-help from the state. 
and it was matched by CDBG. Thank you. Any further questions on the recreation budget from the counselors? Thank you very much for coming in and enlightening us on what is happening in your department and reviewing the budget. Thank you. Counselors, we move to the Library Services Division, page 63 to 65. Good evening, Ms. Whitman and Mr. O'Connell. Um, we normally open, as you probably saw by the previous presenters, to allow the presenters to make a statement about the department they're representing. Thank you, Mr. President, members of council, Madam Mayor. My name is Ann Wharton, and I'm your chief librarian. Sitting next to me is Bob O'Connell, the chairman of our board of trustees. I've been asked to follow a certain format for this brief few minutes that I have here. Uh, I've been asked to start with staffing. Our staffing level right now at the library is 14 full-time, eight part-time, five occasional employees, which means they may do a Sunday once in a while. There is one shared position with the senior center. That's a total of 28 people. As of July 1st, with this budget, the staffing is reduced to myself at half time. One maintenance worker will continue being shared with the senior center and there will be only six staff members all at 19 and a half hours per week. No one benefited. These numbers are different than appear on the budget. It shows uh, 20 staff. It should be eight. This results in 14 formal layoffs and five letters are being sent to the occasional employees. That's 19 out of 28 employees being let go. One employee is being transferred to another city department. That's a 71% reduction in staff. And if you count all the full-time being reduced to part-time, that's a 77% reduction in staff. Come January, I am very concerned that there will be no staff left because benefits will expire at the end of December. I am next supposed to address our goals and how they relate to bringing about a cleaner, safer city that engages the community. Frankly, I have trouble addressing this. Reducing the library to 21 hours from 66 hours a week and keeping the building closed four out of seven days will result in trash not being picked up on the streets, non-secured areas being frequented by homeless, and there will be vandalism. In reference to engaging the community, there is no better that place than your public library to engage the community both intellectually and in community concerns. The third and fourth points I was supposed to address are about future growth and our role in helping the city achieve its goals and our projections for the future. The projections on page 58 show no future for the library. We are proud of all the services we offer. In one year, 176,000 items are borrowed from the library. 54,000 of those are from the children's collection. In one year, 500 immigrants attended an English as a second language class or a class in citizenship to prepare for the U.S. citizenship exam. Almost 6,000 children attended a story time or a special event in the children's room. 320 adults went to a book club meeting. Our meeting rooms were used by community organizations 574 times in one year. We provide we provided 28,000 items to other libraries last year. 16,000 items were sent to us to fill requests by our patrons. It took decades to put that system of resource sharing into place. We now participate in a resource sharing in our computer network, kind of making it one big library. This is the most significant loss with this budget. Losing certification means no resident of Fitchburg will be able to order a book from another library, request an item online, go to another library, or check out anything. 
Our certification will be lost in January. We won't be able to reapply until 2012. And with the projections published on page 58, we don't have a glimmer of a chance for certification until the year 2015. There are currently 338 certified libraries in Massachusetts. 14 are not certified. We would join that list. We would be the largest library on that list. Some council members have suggested a waiver for certification requirements from the state due to the city's financial hardship. To be eligible for a waiver, our budget must be reduced within 5% of all other budget cuts. And that's not the case. We're looking at a 68% overall budget cut. Your decision to accept this budget will affect toddlers, preschoolers, grade school students, middle school students, high school students, college students, the person applying for a job online, the adult whose computer died and whose paper is due tomorrow, the mother with children trying to start their kids off right, that guy next door looking for some ideas to build his deck, the person typing a resume who frankly needs help doing that, the movie watcher who enjoys just borrowing our DVDs, and the readers of Dean Koontz and Grisham and Patterson. There will be no Sunday concerts, no story times, no beautiful displays in front of the library, no resources for homeschoolers because as of January, their ability to borrow from other libraries will be over. There will be no English as a second language for immigrants. There will be no preparation for the citizenship test. There will be no visits from daycare facilities in the YMCA. We will have no newspapers. There is no money in this current budget for emergency call-ins when the alarms go off at 3 o'clock in the morning. There are going to be so few new books, people are going to think we've become a museum. This budget is heartbreaking and history-making. It effectively ends a 140-year-old institution. We will be joining that very small list of decertified libraries. We will be the largest library on that list and the library from the largest city to be decertified. We are asking you to please reconsider this budget. Thank you. I had uh, Anne's being kind of humble in how she prepared this budget. In the preliminary budget the mayor presented to us, Anne's salary was uh, a full salary and she had a full-time clerical help. But she could only have three or three and a half people working uh, on the floor. On her own, she took and cut the salary, her salary in half, the 38,500. And she eliminated the clerical position, so now she can have approximately six uh, individuals working part-time. We talked about the uh, cut of $760,089. But the money lost to the library is going to, uh, including the budget cut, amount to uh, $921,889 in total in grants and um, foundation grants and money owed to the library itself. I don't think that the mayor on her own cut the chief librarian's salary in half. The mayor, in conjunction with her finance team, looked over all budgets and made cuts based on the studies that they have made and then submitted the budgets to the city council. Would you like to make a comment on that, Mayor? Actually, I, I do want to make a correction. Um, they stated correctly that uh, Anne on her own made that choice to do that in oh, order to save I'm sorry, some I positions. thought I interpreted it to say that you made the cut. I know, okay. They had said that in my budget, All right, it was I'm a sorry. full salary, and then she had cut that. Councilor Joseph. And I have a letter here. Um, it states, Dear Honorable City Councilors, 
We are residents from the city of Fitchburg. On behalf of our public library and its patrons, both young and old, we request that you reject the mayor's budget for the year 2008-2009. Our public library is an essential part of our community because it helps enhance the quality of our lives. For many years, the Fitchburg residents have enjoyed the many different services that our public library provides. Some of the services include interlibrary loans, computer networking, children's programs, as well as art shows and concerts, summer reading programs, and access to the latest materials and resources. These services helped us, especially the young children in our community, because they support learning. The mayor's proposed budget will eliminate many of these services, and this budget may not be cost effective for our city. With our budget and library, we'll lose its certification and will only open three days a week. Their decision will cost us to lose state funds, grants, decline in our property values, and possible vandalism and rise in juvenile crimes. With all of these factors to consider, we urge that you fully fund the library's budget respectfully the undersigned by 894 citizens of the city of Fitchburg. Um, there's a letter to the city council from a, close to 1,000 residents in the city of Fitchburg. That particular presentation that you just made uh, must be presented to the city clerk, please, and she will uh, clock it in so that it will go on record with the city of Fitchburg. Thank you. Councilor Di Natale. Mr. Mayor, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but I, I don't, I'd like to have an explanation as to why the, the big cut. I'm not, I, I, I don't really know exactly all the facts you and your financial team do. Can you, I'd like to, an explanation as to the rationale behind your decision for this budget before I make any decisions. I want to hear what, what the rationale was for these cuts, mm -hmm. if you will, please. Well, first, um, after identifying a $1 million structural budget deficit in fiscal year 08 and then a $5 million structural budget deficit in fiscal year 09, I had to do a few things. First is, is freeze all spending and basically watch every penny. Um, and the second is, is look at how to build the budget from fiscal year 2009. And in doing so, I looked at all departments and had them prepare multiple budgets. And th those are uh, spreadsheets that I know I, I shared with a number of you. That showed um, what would happen if we cut uh, different departments by 250,000, 500,000, 750,000, a million dollars, and of course there are some departments that have been cut more than that. For smaller departments, there are departments that are only 100,000 or 200,000. We looked at smaller increments, such as the recreation department. What happens if you cut a splash park? What happens if you cut the pool? What do programmatic costs? Um, and then in adding all those cuts that I had asked, um, those multiple budgets, it only amounted to about three and a half million dollars worth of cuts. So we identified that even if we just, every cut imaginable that we've asked our departments to cut everything, and that include closure of the library, that include closure of the Summer Street Fire Station, it was only three and a half million dollars. I had shared that with a lot of you. And I'd said, all right, we've got to make up this gap. How do we do that? So in trying to figure out that gap, we looked at every possible source. I brought in volunteers. We looked at um, health care. We looked at working with, with uh, unions. We tried a lot of things possible but with contracts, with everything else. There are just some areas that we couldn't touch. We couldn't reduce those areas at all. For example, and I, and I support the schools, but we, we, couldn't, we can't cut the schools any, any more than that um, because they would take that out of, uh, out of chapter um, 70 monies um, because we're at a minimum net school spending. So it was left on the city side. So in looking at those cuts, we needed to find new revenue sources. And that's where I started talking about um, a few options. I had the options on the bottom of where can we find health care savings. And we've been meeting with the unions and trying to find health care savings. Those are things that they were accepted the sum, the sum, but the others, I couldn't guarantee. If they said no, there's no way that I can put those savings on the table. The other options were fees, looking at new fees. And I had talked about the, the trash fee, and we've, I think we've all seen what the response has been thus far to that. And the third option has, was a, is a Proposition 2.5 override, which I know a lot of people from the library have talked about. Um, and then the fourth option 
is uh, because we have limited sources to bring in additional funds, because we're looking at cuts on one side, revenue on the other side, um, is, okay, what, where is that additional revenue? So I talked about um, health care savings, you know, cutting expenses. We did as much as we could given existing contracts. I proposed a, a fee that's still under discussions. We've been talking about a proposition to adapt override, and then there's everything else. And that everything else, given the limited abilities of a municipality to raise funds, are through taxes, uh, are through new growth. So above and beyond the two and a half is new growth. This is an, an unfortunate, unfortunate economy that we're in right now. So we had to downgrade new growth. So we, we a few years ago, had one, $1.1 $1 .1 million in additional funds. Then we looked at 800000 and now we're down to $400,000 in additional funds. So if you looked at all these devastating cuts at $3.5 million and then trying to find new revenue to close that $5 million budget gap, this it just it was seemingly impossible. So, and, and basically doing things like nickeling and dime everything like I think we're looking at now, budget line item by line item by line item, trying to find savings, um, trying to, do, you know, trying to move away from the, the devastating thing. How can we keep the South Street Fire Station open? Um, if not fully, at least some. How can we keep the library open? Um, at least, at least some, because the initial go around was all these really devastating things that only amounted to three and a half million dollars. So we've been spending as much of our time finding new revenue, looking for new revenue sources, because we don't want to have to make further cuts. So that was the, the rationale for getting to this budget. Um, in terms of, of, of you know, why this is 68% and others are 39% and others are a little less, um, that was actually also the rationale for the reorganization. It's hard to cut everybody, let's say, 30% when you have departments of one person or you have a department of two with really no expenses. So part of the, the consolidation of taking 22 departments and creating 10 was, was unfortunately so we could uh, potentially look at sharing staff. So three departments with three clerical becoming one department with one clerical. Those are all the types of things that we're looking at making things more streamlined in order to find those savings and still actually function as, as a city. Um, so all the cuts that I've made here are so unfortunate. They are cuts that were devastating to me to make. They were very, very difficult to make. But I was committed to submitting a balanced budget to the council, and I am open and committed to fighting for what the citizens want. Um, I have cut up the credit cards, so I can't put things on credit cards. I apologize for that. So if there is a reallocation, I've heard that word, if there is additional fees that we can raise, if there's, a, um, if there's support for a proposition two and a half override, those are things I need to hear. And if you, I've heard oftentimes today, you need to do better, you need to do more. I have done a lot over the last five months. I know I could have done a lot more, and I know I still have a lot more to do. But I need to stop, I need to listen, to what you have to say. I, I listened to a lot of you outside today. I'm listening to you here right now. And I'm looking for all of your help in finding solutions. This is, the, this is a budget that was ultimately decided by one person, myself. And do I take full responsibility for making this final decision to submit to the council? Absolutely. Am I going to take full responsibility on my part to do whatever I can to achieve and become the city we want? Absolutely. But I can't do it alone. And if I have 40,000 people who are working against just me, one person, and not working for an issue, then that's not going to get us anywhere. So I don't have all the answers. And I'm, I'm trying to be as open as possible about the methodology. Um, a lot of it is, is turning over every stone that I can to find funding. And sometimes when I turn over the stone, I find out that the hole is bigger than what I thought it was. Because this was not clear on day one that we had deficits of this size. So these are things that, again, cutting up the credit cards, let's find solutions together. I know this is unfortunate. I know there's a lot of people who don't agree with the decisions that I've made. But this is where democracy comes in. This is where these public forums become incredibly helpful, where I hear from you, and I hear from you what you're willing, uh, willing to do and what you want me to do and what you want the council to do.
the, the issue with a lot of people is certification with the state. And if this budget were level funded from last year, it's my understanding we still wouldn't be certified. Is that correct? If we didn't increase a dollar from this budget, if we gave the library what it got last year, it could remain open all week, we still would lose certification. Is that correct? Well, I will let, um, I will let the, uh, the librarian answer that, but the library does have to increase by 2.5% among many other things to retain certification. Because that was, that was a question I got a lot from a lot of library advocates, and, and from my understandings last year, if it's not increased at all, the certification's gone anyway. So it's kind of a difficult situation in that respect. So is that correct? If it was level funded this year, it would not, we would not be certified anyway. There's a number of criteria for certification, um, the two biggest ones that you're referring to. One is uh, it's not that the uh, money from the city has to go up every year. That's not true. It's the average of the previous three-year municipal appropriation has to increase by 2.5%. Last year, our budget was cut $48,888. So we survived because the previous year to that, there was a very small increase that offset it, but it's an average. This year, we, were, we did need a $29,000 budget increase over last year to offset that decrease. But even that, that's the one big issue, is the municipal appropriation requirement. The other one is we must be open 63 hours a week to maintain certification. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Salamito. And bear with me if, if I go on longer than I maybe should. I think a library is a reflection of a city's commitment to its citizens in encouraging interest in the arts, history, education, literature, and music. A library is far more than a building containing books. It benefits all ages, young and old. A reduction in the budget for next year of anywhere from 68 to 75 percent, in my opinion, speaks a very clear message. Literature in the arts is not a priority to the citizens of Fitchburg, and to me, that is not acceptable. Some departments in the city in the next budget lost 10 percent next year. That's the police department. Fire department lost 13 percent. And both of those departments came in front of us and cried, poverty, poverty, poverty. The law department went down 4%, and I was not happy with that, but it did. And the library is going to lose 70 or 75%. And some people in this room are not blinking an eye. People have said, if you can't find a book in the library, or you're not happy with the closure, go to Barnes & Noble or go on the internet. That's not the answer. Many people don't have the internet. Many people don't have the money to go to Barnes & Noble. But even if you have the internet, you can look up the history of World War II. You can look up the atrocities of the Holocaust. But until you read a book and delve into a novel, or the people who have come who have experienced the Holocaust, you can't get it off the internet. You just can't. You've got to read a book. I haven't read as many as I would have liked, but I want to, and I try. I have got calls, and I'm sure that every member of the council have gotten calls within the last month. My calls have come from the library being reduced in the trash fee. Those calls amounted to 100% of the calls that I have received. And of those calls, the reduction of the library was way number one. Did I get a call about the pool closing? No. Did I get a call about we need more police cruises or bigger cruises or more money for the police department? Didn't get one call. We're here because of the citizens. Our Fitchburg chose us. 
and they said, listen to our concerns. If we sit here and do nothing, we're telling the people who elected us, I'm not listening to your concerns. And that bothers me, because I, for one, am listening to what they want. Their priority is a library, education. Some people in this council are very upset at losing a pool for 10 weeks. And then I want to balance it, a pool for 10 weeks or a library to teach education, science, literature, history. To me, it isn't even close of a balance test. George Wallace gave to Fitchburg, and I apologize if I'm going on too long, and tell me to stop if, if you want me to. George Wallace gave the Wallace Civic Center to Fitchburg, and when they gave it, when he gave it to our city, it was a jewel. It had not only the skating rink, but it had the planetarium, science, education, and learning. Fitchburg and its forefathers kind of left the planetarium, the education, the science, drop. And their focus was skating, skating, and skating. And what happened to the jewel of that planetarium? It fell into disrepair. What it said to the fit what it said to the citizens is, we don't care about education, literature, or science. We care about skating. And that bothered me. Eventually, we lost both of them. The skating died, too. George Wallace came to Fitchburg, and he gave us the public library. Many cities and towns didn't have a person as wonderful as Mr. Wallace. He gave it to us to promote education to read about history, to read about the Holocaust, to read about how good the world is and how great we are and what we can do in the United States and in Fitchburg. I think he would turn in his grave if he were to see that that building is going to be used three days a week. There are grants that have put money into repairing the fence around Crocker Field. Now, I'm not opposed to Crocker Field restoration. And I think a fence and maybe building and restoring it is important. But can't we find block grant money? Can't we find money to put into a library? Because if I were to balance a football field and a fence in a library with education for our children in every age group, I don't think it's a big test. I think it's pretty easy to decide. I can't sit here and not voice the concerns of the people who elected me, the people that have called. If you've called me and I haven't returned every call, I apologize. But I've heard your call, I've heard your messages, and I'm here because this is what you want, it's what I want, and what Fitchburg needs. This, we can't look at this budget and say we can't afford to do the library. The answer is we can't afford not to keep that library open. I apologize if I took that. Councilor Tran. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well said, Councilor Salamito. You took half of my comments, and doing so, no thank you. Um, Mr. President, I, I'd like to read an excerpt from a long letter that we all received. Quote, in a recent letter to my mother-in-law responding to her concerns about the proposed library budget, one city councilor referred to her advocacy efforts as support for a pet project. I sincerely hope that's not the collective view of the council, unquote. And it is not. I want to extend an apology to the person who wrote this, his mother-in-law, and to the public that such an infantile comment was made. It does not represent the council as a whole, and it doesn't represent my view. I've been 
a supporter of the library, and I will continue to be a supporter of the library. I'm an advocate for the children for a long time. A lot of people know that. I believe the library is in an institution similar to our schools, and it educates our children. You mentioned that it provides service to a lot of people, and I agree. It provides services to the rich, the poor, the young and the old, people of all races. And you cannot put a dollar amount on that. One thing that you failed to mention by closing the library is that it does something that we're trying to avoid. And that is, it puts an empty building in a location where we're trying to revitalize. And we do not want to do that. Um, you know, throughout this whole budget process, I have not made a recommendation to the city clerk. And I'm about to do so. And if Madam Clerk would record my recommendation that all the funds that we find end of this budget hearing that to be allocated to the library. Thank you. Councilor Caddy. It was interesting. I was in Falmouth, Mass. last week. There's four public libraries at Falmouth, Mass. Um, I, I didn't know that and struggling with this topic. Um, somebody told me that, that down, told me about down there and, it's, and it is true. I'm upset by this. I'm very upset by this, but I, I want to side with the mayor on this one. This is a very difficult decision. I'm not, I'm not happy. I'm embarrassed for us. Actually, very embarrassed for us. But if, 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 if the counselors have to come up with $800,000, you have to do it here. So how many policemen do we want to lay off? How many more firemen do we lay off? If it's five, and it may be Oak Hill Station, we'll go down to two, two trucks. We can't cut the school budget. Can't touch the veterans, parks, DPW. This is a lot of money. We're all in this together. Um, we got to come up with some good ideas. I mean, is there any partnerships? Can we partner with Fitchburg State College? Can we partner with Lemister and Lunenburg, Westminster? Do we dare to keep the library open with available funds full time until, until it runs out? Could that buy us some time? $190,000. How, how many weeks can we stretch that out until we can come up with an idea? You know, do we go for broke? You know, uh, I'm sure there isn't a council in this room that likes the situation that we're in. And I know that people in the audience don't like it. Now, now's not the, now isn't the time to be pointing fingers. This, now's the time to partnership and get to work. So again, we can, we can talk about this all we want, but this is time. It's time that we partnership. It's time we get to work, try to find the money, try to come up with some good ideas. Thank you. Councilor Joseph. I agree with the comments of all of the councilors so far. It sounds like Gilligan from Gilligan's Island. I agree with you, Skipper. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> but uh, it, there's just, it's devastating to the community to see that the priority for the library has brought it to a level where we can only open three days a week. It's devastation. It's it's something that we're not going to realize today the impact of it uh, we won't we won't see it next week when it's only there three days a week but three years from now when we see the delinquency rate when we see the illiteracy rate when we see the um, kids that are that have fallen out that can't get into college that are less and less accepted into colleges in, in the, from Fitchburg that's when we'll realize the devastation of, of reducing the hours at the library is there an answer? It, it's just there, right now there is no answer. The, the citizens of Fitchburg um, have spoke loud and clear that they don't want any more fees, they don't want any more taxes. 
but the, the question has to go out to the citizens of Fitchburg. Do they want to pony up and have the fees to keep police and fire on board? And do they want to pony up in order to keep the library open? It's not, a, it's not, this isn't a budget that was created by the current mayor just to devastate the city. I mean, this is a budget that the mayor has inherited a $5 million deficit. This isn't something that she just says, well, <laughs> I'm going to just spend $5 million less this year because I don't want to spend $5 million that I have. We don't have $5 million. Is it devastating? Absolutely. But how do we, we like Councillor Caddy said, and that's where I agree with him, it, we as citizens have to find the solution to this problem. We it through growth in the industry, be it through growth in commercial, residential, the tax base has to grow because we don't have additional revenues. Is it by cutting expenses further in the areas of uh, personnel line items? That's something that I hope the mayor can work on in, in contract negotiations and things like that. Um, there's, there's some things that the city cannot help. Our health care has gone up, retirement costs have gone up, fuel costs have gone up, but there are some things that we can control and that's labor costs and things like that within the city in order to help bring the budget back down to where it goes. As far as revenues go, like I said, the city, the, the, as so Salomino said, half of the calls that he's gotten during this budget process is people that don't want to pay additional fees and taxes. I've gotten those same calls. And yet, that's the answer to our solution is more, more money coming into the city. With no money, there's less services. Money doesn't come from nowhere. So it's a matter of where we're going to go from here how are we as a, as a city and a community going to allow ourselves to grow and stop burying ourselves in our hands and saying, oh, woe is us, what a, what a lousy hand we've been dealt, and uh, where are we going to go from here? It's a matter of we take ourselves into the future, and uh, I would just ask that in the future, if one of the counselors would stop apologizing for all of us, because I think that we're all our own person, we all stand for what we all believe in. I believe in, I do not believe in the, the library being a pet project for anybody, but I don't believe that a counselor needs to apologize for me to that. Thank you. Councilor Boivet. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Wharton, and I want to thank you for the picture of doom and gloom that you, that you painted for us at the beginning of your, your speech. Uh, the matter of fact is we only have just so much money to go around. Uh, by cutting where necessary, we are losing six policemen. We're losing 12 firefighters. Uh, we are losing countless number of, of hours of, of protection for our citizenship. Uh, we have a DP, uh, Department of Public Works who maintains 255 miles of roads. Uh, those roads are maintained by a full crew, if everybody comes to work, of 15 employees. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it is too bad that the public library is being cut down to three days a week. Uh, but it would be devastating if we had to cut more, more police, more fire, um, forego any new equipment for the Department of Public Works to maintain our roads so that we could go to the public library if need be, or perhaps maintain our roads so that our citizens don't get into accidents in the wintertime. Um, I am not happy that the library is being cut, cut back this way. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us are. But the, the, picture, the picture that we are looking at is public safety. Public safety is, is, is of the utmost. Uh, without, the, without the necessary police department, uh, the, the necessary police officers, I believe that part of your picture that you painted was the anarchy or, or, or the uh, uh, criminal, criminal aspect of our society would, would erupt. Um, 
this we can't have. We cannot have this type of anarchy in our streets. Uh, we cannot put our firefighters in a position where we only have two trucks to maintain a city of this size. It does, does not make any sense. And on this budget, I do believe that I would, I, I would go along with, with the mayor. Councilor Di Natale. Thank you. Um, I stated when I was brought on here about employee figures in terms of salary and benefits that encompass the whole budget. I know people don't want to go back into the past, but I read publications every week in the national media about watchdog groups saying that benefits such as pensions and retirement are skyrocketing. Health care is skyrocketing. And this is going to sound like I'm taking an affront to union membership. But I read publication after publication how these costs will never go down. And I have stated in the past that the current mayor and the mayor after her and any other mayor in the future needs to sit down and they need to say, your entire contract needs to be restructured or you're not getting anything. And that hasn't been done. We talk about police reductions, we talk about fire reductions, we talk, talk about other reductions, and I understand there are areas of the city that haven't gotten anything in many years. But this is what I'm reading from experts. And we have a $98 million budget, 25% uh, of that is employee benefits, over a quarter. And as Councillor Joseph correctly said, health care keeps exploding, pension costs keep exploding. When's it going to end? There is about $50 million in this budget that we can't touch because they're all contract negotiated through years and years of just saying yes, no problem. We have areas that are getting 100% sick time buyback, unheard of in the private sector, and the state's going through that right now too. And the, the argument against changing these contracts is that you don't respect what we do. You don't appreciate what we do. Well, that's not true. The truth is there are other areas in, 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 in the country, people who work who don't get those amenities, I mean those, those benefits, 100%. I indicated yesterday, the fire department budget, 1.3 million in benefits. And I don't mean to single them up, that's just one example. And if they cut that number in half, they would save all those positions. I'm not going to sit here and say that the mayor did not go through hard, you know, very tough decisions here. I understand she did. But my issue has always been with benefits. And I'm getting sick and tired of reading these publications saying that we need to do more about them when every mayor we've elected has said, no problem, take it. And it's not salary. It's everything else beyond the salary. And if those are restructured, I couldn't imagine how much we could save. But pension, retirement, and health care are the three big, three big issues that have to occur at the state and the federal level. And we need any negotiations that go forward. I would advocate that the mayor put her foot down and if you want to raise, you got to give up a lot within the, below the raise. And again, I say all this because over a third of our budget is dedicated to employee benefits. A third that we can't touch. And I don't blame the unions for this. I blame the leaders in the past that allowed it to happen. And it's all over the place. <coughs> so I don't want to see the library reduced. Uh, the issue with me is, how do we maintain certification? In order to maintain certification, we have to increase beyond what was given last year. And counselors have stated correctly about fairness. I, I find it very difficult to support increasing one budget and all the other ones are getting significant hits. So it's, it's difficult for me to <coughs> say, I'm for this and I'm not for this. I don't want this to happen. But if I look at these numbers, I have already made suggestions 
of around $150,000. There's, there's another one here I, don't, I, I gotta put on here, but $150,000 in cuts. I drove the point home weeks ago about money left over at the end of the fiscal year and we were being told that we're gonna finish okay this year. We had enough to buy cruisers. There's 150,000 I think we can get by without and reallocated. I put together a package for everybody that called for over 500,000 in reallocations. We don't decide where that money gets reallocated, as everyone knows. Mayor Wong does. That is an avenue that she can take. I stated I'd like to see public safety retained, but it's not my call. So this is the, this is the opportunity, as Councilor Caddy and Joseph and Tran and Salmito said, reallocation. And the, the argument that may be coming forward about upsetting departments by taking money out of their area and giving it to another, it's not their money. It's the people's money. <coughs> so that argument is thrown out the window, in my opinion. As to tax increases, the trash fee, as was stated, people, yes, they want more, but they don't want to pay less. I'm not a fan of Proposition 2 and a half. I'm not going to support that. Because people don't say they don't care about the library or public safety because they don't care about the tax increase. They're saying, you've raised them over 20 years. You've raised everything over 25 years. And you're telling me we're getting far less. If this was a private company, we'd all be fired. So that's why they don't want those increases. And I wholeheartedly agree with them. Because they've paid a lot already. And they feel they're not getting anything for it as evidence of these budgets. So it's a difficult position. I'm not for tax increases. I'm not for the trash fee. But I don't want to see the library closed. So what I've advocated is cuts in the budget for reallocation purposes that we can recommend to the mayor where they can go, but Mayor Wong has to make the decision. But we should give her that opportunity to make that decision as she stated a partnership helping her out. That's one way we can help her out. As of... Uh June 5th, the proposed recommended cuts in the budget are 123,900 as submitted to the clerk and to our auditor. This amount, no way, is going to keep the library open. And I agree with you about the benefits that are handed out. And I say they're handed out because they were handed out in the corner office over the years. But right now, this city is spending $12,500,000 for health insurance for employees. That's what we are contributing. Other benefits are $700,000. And I agree with you, we have to put the brakes on. But we can't put the brakes on one department. It has to be across the board. I'll make an observation, and maybe there's a reason for it, but last year, former city councilor Donnelly and I were given a special tour of the Gardner Library, a brand new library. We specifically asked the question, how many people are employed here? The response was four full-time people. Why do we have a total of full-time and part-time employees of 29? Who allowed that? Mr. President, may I address that? Yes, you may. The Gardner Library has 13 employees, 10 of which are full-time. They currently have 11 full-time equivalents. Well, their you, budget currently this year is $600,000. Well, if their budget is that low and they have that many people, I cannot understand why we have to have twice the amount of people. If I uh, may? The yes. The building size is 32,000 square feet. Ours is 45,000 square feet. Their population is half ours. They have a 20,000 20, population. Ours is 40. Um, our full-time equivalents as of now, um, as I just had somebody else resign, is 17.8, Gardner's is 11. A far better comparison would be us with Lemonster. And Lemonster has a similar population, 
they have more employees than we have currently. They have 26 employees, 16 full-time, 10 part-time, 19 full-time equivalents. Their budget is currently $40,000 higher than ours. I still think that we need to take a look, as we said last night to both the police chief and the fire chief, uh, not last night on the police, we need to do a study, a personnel study, to determine how many people do we really need in some of these departments. And I will just revert back to the police and to the fire department where we hear, we don't have enough cops. You guys got too many firefighters. We got just enough firefighters, just enough cops. We need to have some type of a consultant come into the city and take a look at our major departments and do a complete personnel study and take a look at the benefits that we are offering. One of the problems, and I will uh, mention this, because Councilor Di Natale mentioned it, one of the problems we have is that no one in this city council is privy to any information about any union contract until it lands on our desk. We have absolutely no input. And then if we say no and we send it back, guess what? We're the bad guys. We are the bad guys. The firefighters, uh, I read a recent article, and they said the reason that there hasn't been any changes in fire services is because they live on tradition, and we can't break tradition. We have to break tradition everywhere. We have to study. I am going to support the mayor on this budget. That is going to be my position. We cannot add a single dime, a single penny, to this budget. She and her financial team worked hard on this budget, submitted it to the council, and if we can cut, we can cut, but we can't add. Councilor Di Martino. Oh. Okay. Good evening. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to come at this uh, at a different way, and I'd like somebody to explain to me what is uh, the Friends of the Library, that is you, Mr. O'Connell, that's part of your job. Yeah. Is that what it's called, Friends of the Library? No, I'm on the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees. Uh, the Board of Trustees, what part do they play in the public libraries every day go, you know, going on, and, or do they have any activities, or what happens? Do we have activities? We meet monthly. Yeah. Uh, we sit down with the library director and coordinate the programs that are going to be uh, presented uh, we hire, in conjunction with the library director, new employees. We hire the library director as mandated by the uh, chatter. Uh, basically, uh, try to uh, present the communities uh, involved in, with the activities and the uh, proceedings at the library. Good. And is there a trust fund that the that that board has? Is there money in the library itself that you work and look over? Is there money there? That's correct. Could you tell me how much there is? Uh, right now it's about 1.4 million. In there, okay. Yeah. And um, last year you sold a painting at Shelby's Auction House. That's correct. And how much did you get for that painting? Uh, I think it, we got about 91,000. And what happened to that 91,000? Well, when we were looking for a library director, mm. one of the things that we were most concerned about that the library basically had become kind of stagnant. We needed it rejuvenated. We needed some changes to be made. And when we uh, interviewed Anne, she presented to us some classic ideas about how can we improve circulation? How can we get more people into the library? How can we make the uh, library a community center instead of just a library? Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought that's exactly the position we wanted to go. If you had been into the library in the last few years, when you into, came into it initially, it was rather drab. It was, um, it hadn't changed in, since George Wallace presented us 
with the library in 1967. And Ann started proceedings uh, immediately on trying to uh, bring about some changes. Because of articles in the uh, Boston Globe about uh, one Russian artist that uh, struck it rich and his paintings became valuable. Um, and a number of phone calls that came to Ann as the, as the library director indicating that at one time in the past, uh, in the 40s, uh, a, one of our benefactors provided some money to buy a painting by this artist. Uh, initially, uh, it was presented to, because the library, the original library was knocked down. George Wallace presented to us with a new one. We had it over at the Art Museum for a great many years. They informed us, I think it was 1991, that uh, they weren't using it. They didn't want it anymore. So we brought it back, put it downstairs in the basement against the wall, and it stayed there for the next uh, 16 years collecting dust. And went down, was just checking the condition of the library and what's in it, and came across this painting. And she asked the board, what can I do with it? Well, let's find out what it's worth. So she contacted Sotheby's. Um, they came up, they investigated, and uh, they thought it was uh, in prime condition. And uh, we gave them her to go ahead to uh, put it up for auction. They came and they took it. In fact, they brought it to St. Petersburg in Russia and put it on display to promote the auction. It was an auction of all Russian arts and crafts, and um, it sold for the, we get approximately 91000 And we then applied that money to the uh, designer that she had uh, contacted, and we had discussed about improving the entrance of the library, making it more attractive, and it's paid off. Uh, what um, we have seen since Ian's been there, an increase in book circulation in the adult library and even in the children's library, and the reorganization of the materials we had. Many of the materials we had for years were downstairs in the basement that no one, none of the community could see or know about. Uh, if they inquired, one of the librarians went downstairs, brought it up, and they were able to take it out. But uh, it, it really wasn't working at all. So uh, what we wanted to do was exactly what Ian proceeded to do, rejuvenate the library, begin uh, to make it move forward. She's also, at the same time, uh, started a renovation project. And as you know, because the city council has uh, given us 5000 mm. toward that, and the state has given us 40000 Yes. Uh, that we uh, wanted to proceed mm. and to make uh, not only some major changes, because we now have a lot of dead space. We have a bookmobile area that is unusable. We have uh, portions of the uh, first floor that are not being used at all. And of course, the basement is uh, in total disarray because it's just large and cumbersome, and um, we can't make best use of it. So um, we have been proceeding. We have just uh, got the approval on the uh, application and the renovation program that she presented to the state. Um, in fact, knowing that, after speaking with the mayor, that this year coming up was going to be a tough year, we asked her if she could uh, talk to the mass board in Boston and see if they could uh, postpone our uh, year of uh, when construction loans would become available. And they did. They told her that we proceeded carefully and uh, hung on to as much uh, money as possible in our trust funds uh, so that uh, in uh, the year 2011, if we were certified by that time, That's the question. Uh, they would consider us <coughs> and put us on the list for major construction. I'd like to point out, it isn't just renovations and, and new construction. Since George Wallace gave us the building, in 1967, uh, the same roof has been on there. And three years ago at a budget hearing, I presented 
the that roof is in dire need of help. It needs a new roof, and uh, nothing has been done. We have two boilers, one of which does not function at all. The second one has been repaired numerous times. In fact, uh, before we can use it in the fall, it needs a new firewall. We have an HVAC system with 108 units. 50% of them do not function. I know that. Many of them have had fires in them because of lack of maintenance, because we haven't had the uh, budget to uh, keep them up to date and improve them. So we have uh, some major concerns, and Anne has addressed those. And uh, one of the major problems I think we have with this budget is we're not going to have just uh, a cut in personnel. We're going to have no full-time employees at all. None of our employees are going to be uh, eligible for any of the benefits. And it's going to just make it over the line. She may be. But it's inevitable because of the projected budget that between now and the year 2013, there's going to be no financial growth at the library. Uh, we're not going to be certified at the earliest, as she indicated, 2015, if at that point in time we get a significant increase in, in funds. But we have some major work that's going to have to be done, any one of which, a boilers, HV system goes down completely. Um, we're going to run out of money a lot sooner than next June. Uh, we may have to close uh, because of lack of funds completely. Bob, if, if the accreditation doesn't come through and this becomes a reality, uh, getting back to the trust, the money that you have, what happens to that money? Well, it depends on what trust fund you're mentioning. I mean, the money, that are I mean, the amount of money that you have. How, what will happen to that money? Uh, if the library goes out of business? Yes. Well, I guess legally it belongs to the city of Fitchburg, but I know that people who have donated funds expect them to be donated uh, to serve the needs that they produced. And I can't speak for George Wallace, and I can't speak for many of the individuals, but I can speak for one organization. The Irish American a few years ago gave $5,000 know for books on Irish history, Irish American history, uh, Irish literature, and if the city were not to uh, follow our request, I, I know personally, because I'm involved with the Irish American, that we would uh, request that money be back, taken back, and given back to the uh, organization. And I think many other organizations would request the same thing. Is there anywhere in the bylaws of, of that that it states that if you had a dire emergency that you could use that temporarily? Well, we have. Yeah. yeah. We have in the last... Um, Three years, we had a leak, major leak. Well, I'll say many, many leaks in the mm. children's library. Mm. We went for a period of two years trying to get the uh, roof fixed. And we just couldn't go anywhere. We just couldn't get that project moving mm. uh, by the powers that be. Finally, with the uh, mayor at that present time, three years ago, um, asked us if we would take some money out of the uh, Wallace Fund, and uh, we did. And we, we donated 45000 because it wasn't healthy for the employees in the children's library. Uh, we noticed uh, long before the roof was finished, then we had the librarians were working, there was mold on the walls, mm. significant mold. Uh, we then took out, and out of trust funds, paid $2,500 they have a consultant come in to tell us how bad the mold was. I know. And then the city, uh, I think because they were insured, pay I think it was 25000 to clean up the mold. Uh, just uh, 18 months ago, the mayor uh, asked the board for a loan. And the mayor, uh, letter right here, uh, asked us if we would loan the city uh, $30,000 to fix the elevator. And we uh, finally agreed simply because if the elevator wasn't fixed, the second floor in the library would not be available to anyone uh, that had a disability. And we knew 
that the first thing was going to happen, we were going to get sued for not making that available to the whole community. So we uh, agreed, and the mayor, in writing, right here, uh, said he would repay us. And was it ever repaid? No, it was 21600 That was the, the final amount that uh, we had to uh, okay. loan the city. And no, I had expected it in this budget that we would uh, get that payment, and obviously that's, uh, okay. that hasn't been done. I just, I just wanted to bring up that part of it because there's many people asking questions. And when I deal with it, I want to deal with the whole picture. So you say a year from now, if we are accredited, we have a chance of getting some help for, to do some building over there or do some renovations. If we can be certified by 2011, Anne has uh, mm. spoken to the, the powers that be in Boston. Mm. And they said we would then be eligible to uh, receive construction grants. She also, because the mayor has indicated, you know, how do different departments, uh, what can they do to bring in some revenue? Yeah. In the course of our looking at the renovation and Ann's work on it, because she did 99% of the work, uh, she has uh, made an informal agreement that has also been approved in Boston uh, by the other department that uh, uh, a library in Fitchburg would uh, wants to expand their hours, make their um, library available to the whole community, and uh, they would uh, like to become part of the Fitchburg Public Library. They need about 6,000 square feet. Uh, they would uh, be willing to uh, pay for the engineering and the construction of their part. It would be open for, for the li from the library and open on the street individually because they have to be open at different hours than we are. Uh, and they would also pay us uh, about $72,000 a year in rent. Uh, now that's all pretty good. It's very exciting. Well, it, it's, I think, going in the right direction. Yes. And I, I think it would be a major improvement for the city and for the library and for this other library that's going to, uh, that'd like to join us. <coughs> I'm very glad, Bob, to hear the history. I do. I, I do know when the library was built because uh, my first husband worked as a carpenter on it, so I go way back with the library. And uh, I, uh, I just want to, you hear so many different <coughs> things. I just thought that if you, if you um, told us the history of what it was, then we have the whole picture. Thank you very much. Councillor Starr. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. O'Connell, it's good to see you again. And I know you do good work down there. Um, Ms. Wernan, you started talking about some of the factors that uh, would result in loss of accreditation. And that um, is right now possibly my biggest concern. And what can be done to save accreditation? I've heard lots of different answers from lots of different people. Coming in here tonight, I was under the impression that the first dollar cut from the budget would result in loss of accreditation. That would leave no interlibrary loans, which is detrimental to those families who rely on the library for homeschooling. I also believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you lose multiple state grants that the library relies on with loss of accreditation. So what I understand so far, and you mentioned that there were many factors involved. The first one you mentioned was the library's budget needs to be raised 2.5% of the average of the last three years. That's one, am I correct? Another one is it must be open 63 hours a week to retain certification. My math says that's nine hours a day, right? What are some of the other factors? Some of the other factors are they must uh, have a, uh, a director with a master's degree in library science. Um, we must uh, participate in reciprocal borrowing between other libraries. Does that have anything to do with the inter is that in That's a library, in a library loan? loan. Okay. We have to be open a few nights a week. I can't remember what the rule is. We've always been open some evenings, so that I believe you guys stay open until eight o'clock at least during we the week. We stay open until eight thirty. Okay. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So the big and we must spend thirteen percent of our operating budget on new materials. 
Okay. Um, so this, by the way, um, this budget, as far as the library is concerned, and um, your li individual library budget, it stinks. <coughs> it really stinks. It stinks for the people of Fitchburg. It stinks for, I don't think, I, I can't imagine, um, I don't know, my 35 years living in this city, a budget session that is a f going to affect probably every single person that lives in, in Fitchburg with some of the proposals. And uh, the people in this room should be congratulated for standing up for what they believe in. Because um, I believe in uh, <laughs> supporting the library as much as anybody. Could you give me a dollar amount then that sure. we need to add to this budget? It, it, Actually, let me, maybe I can answer that question myself. You need a budget of $1.129 million. No. 1.112662. Our required minimum funding to maintain certification is $1,112,662. Okay. Which is slightly less than, than what was submitted. That's 16000 over the required minimum. Okay. Um, there is also one other uh, point to consider is that um, if our budget cut is within 5% of every other budget cut, excluding the schools, we will be eligible for a waiver. And how long does that waiver last? One year. One year. And then what happens? We apply again. I mean, every year it has you can, to be So waived. you can keep receiving waivers? Well, you know, waiver. <laughs> The waivers, um, it's not a, a carte blanche. You just don't get a waiver because you've asked. The Mass Board of Library Commissioners has to grant you a waiver. Um, there is an application process, uh, which is one thing. Uh, the library did receive a waiver in 2004. Um, it was a waiver uh, granted with reservation. And I've been informed by the MBLC that they don't like giving those out all the time. So we did get one with reservation. Um, I believe the budget cut at that point was like a 6%. We were slightly over the, the, the minimum, that 5 And they said, oh, okay, you know. Um, they just don't give them away willy-nilly. Okay, so really the, the best, I mean, waiver is, would be up it's in the It's your last resort. It's an absolute last resort. So in the long run, we need to find, uh, I don't know, $800,000. Is that what you're saying, to, to maintain these services? Right. All right. Um, I don't think that my colleagues up here could have put things any better. Um, for Councilor Salamito, and I, I wanted to do what he did. For the last month, knowing that this night was coming, I sat down at least maybe 20 times and attempted to write something uh, in regards to the library. I have been contacted up and down by constituents of my own, residents, uh, from basically all over the city. Um, a lot of former colleagues that I worked with in the Fitchburg Public School System have contacted me because they know how I feel about education, they know how I feel about literacy, and uh, they know how I feel about the importance of the library. I used the library up until probably I was about 19 or 20 years old through high school. I don't know, probably from the age of two through maybe 18. And then I started using it again when I started bringing my daughter down there, and it's a fantastic place. Um, and I know Councilor Tran brings his daughter down here, and I look around and I see neighbors, former teachers, um, who have spent a lot of time down there. So this really, really upsets me. But I also agree with our council president and many others here. I am going to vote for this budget. And I apologize to those people who I, in, while I was out campaigning last summer, one family in particular brought up the importance of the library twice to me as I went back to ask them more questions. You have fantastic people that work down there, and I hope people appreciate them. The people at work that, that I deal with mostly down in the, the children's library are just fantastic. And <laughs> I, I just think it's, it, as far as staffing goes, it's fantastic. And they should be commended. What does bother me has to do with how this situation has been handled. I don't have the many newspaper articles that I printed out on some of the comments that were made. 
but it feels quite spiteful. You understandably are upset, and I cannot blame you for being upset. And I wish I had it in front of you, but there was a statement that was made that let's close it down all the time. Then they can see how things are done in that city. Is that accurate? I have recommended that the library be closed completely, and I have a number of reasons for that. Okay. The perception of that really bothers me. It feels like if you look in this room right now, mayor included, a third, uh, excuse me, a third of us are brand new to this. I believe there's at least three more people who are on the second term. I feel that we have also been singled out and it bothers me. It bothers me greatly. I ran into you the day after that you had this, right after you had this meeting with the trustees and I was taken back. Um, I understand where the trustees are coming from and uh, I know a lot of them and they're good people and the, the comments that were made really, really reflect negatively on this city. That's not what we're looking for. I took it very personally because if you're going to criticize one body, if you're going to criticize any of these people in this room, I take it personally because we're all in this together. We're going to have disagreements all the time, but we're still one body and we need to function together. So I take that very personally. I think a 68% budget cut I take personally. I, and I understand. I could go on all night on this and believe me, I'm sure the rest of my colleagues could too. But one of the things that I asked every single person that, I con that contacted me individually and I would like to find somebody who tried to contact me individually who I didn't get back to. I asked the question, do you th think there needs to be some cuts? And every single one of those people that I spoke with personally agreed with me. And then they were worried about not having these services. Well, any cut to the library from the present budget would result in the loss of a great many of these services and I don't think that most of the people understand that. Everybody needs to take a cut. The library is taking the biggest cut. People don't want to hear that it's only going to be open three days a week, 21 hours from 12 to 7. People will still be able to go there but it's not going to receive the services. But I really think people need to know that, that the library would have to get an increase and its salary, and excuse me, and its bottom line this year in order to maintain these services. And I don't think that people are aware of that. So, <laughs> as a product of the school system that used that library all through my formative years, as a former teacher in the public schools, <sighs> as a parent, nothing means more to me than education and literacy. But I also have asked those people, can you please find something else that could be cut in order to save these? I agree with what Council Tran said. I think that's a fantastic idea that anything else that we have left, we put into this budget. I don't think it's going to matter. Thank you. Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mr. President. I was asked a little bit earlier in this discussion <clears throat> why such a big cut. Uh, my personal thought is that we have a big cut on us tonight because the library has been spared over the years. Schools have taken millions of dollars in cuts with unfunded mandates. We had the police chief in here the other evening, the fire chief here the other evening. We've seen their cuts over the years, not just this year, over the years. Last year, I questioned Sunday openings. I wanted to close the library on Sundays um, for four hours. That's it. Um, that got shot down. 
when the mayor released information that we have five million dollars in the hole um, I thought it was inevitable that the library was going to take the hit unfortunately uh, inevitable I um, owe no apology for uh, wanting the need for public safety in our homes and in our schools we cannot cut police or fire anymore we have to add to those lines I will certainly continue to listen to any alternatives that we may have for the library thank you can I answer that yes go ahead we did listen to you last year in fact the professional staff at the library volunteered to work Sundays for no pay and they did for this whole year so that item was because of the generosity of our staff uh, that we're trying to hang on to. We're going to be down to seven professional librarians left working approximately 19 hours a week. We know, and without health benefits, we know we're going to lose them. And, you know, we thought initially if this went one year, bite the bullet, we all kind of, uh, you know, do our thing. But the projected budget is very clear for the next uh, four years after that we're going to be r roughly at the same price tag and you know these ladies who work there uh, can't cannot live on 19 hours a week without health benefits it, it's just not right uh, that's one of the big things we were discussing and whether we should stay open or not the people that are going to be affected the most were these professional staff that have some have worked there 20 years and more, and all of a sudden we're going to cut their legs out. They're not going to get a salary. We're going to be losing 20 of them to start with. And, uh, you know, is, is it the right thing to do? The community, uh, I think, understands that. Uh, many of the community uh, leaders, uh, I've had letters, I've had emails on let's start a fund. Let's see if we can raise money. Well, it's, it's a great idea, but it's it's really not realistic to say how much money can we raise well maybe we can raise 50,000 or 100,000 but we have to raise well actually we have to raise the equivalent of 920,000 to get back to where we should be because we're going to lose well you know, we're going to lose 75,000 in state aid right off in January about 7,000 more in state grants that uh, we have to, uh, uh, we're not going to be eligible for because we're going to be uh, in the foreseeable f four years after this uh, still so far away from uh, being certified that the $40,000 the state gave us for the renovation we're going to have to send back. Uh, we just had agreed uh, about a month or six weeks ago to um, participate in the grants of uh, the Gates uh, Foundation they were going to uh, in conjunction with the trust funds uh, provide us with 11 new computers total of about $18,000 and uh, we're going to have to uh, stop that because simply the money isn't going to be there in the hours in fact right now with the budget we have uh, we cannot use the 18 computers that we have functioning downstairs uh, for the general public because uh, the contract calls for I believe 32,000 right, that uh, we need to pay for our services and uh, the budget to uh, provide that. I, I just want to mention about the Sundays uh, if you had volunteers for that that's that's fine and I appreciate those people volunteering but um, you did not get any money taken out of your budget last year for that for Sunday closings that money still stayed in your budget you used it somewhere else they cut the budget down to absolutely the bottom dollar that maintains certification that's correct right which meant that and that allowed us to remain open on Sunday that's correct because I need 63 hours a week well, I remember that very well thank you Councilor Dina Telly can I promise uh, um, uh, just just to respond to what you said mr. president about the contracts I understand 
that we don't have any say in those things for the most part. It's just an avenue. Mayor wants transparency. That's an idea. And it should be across the board. And my only motivation is to keep the people in those departments, to help them. Not to attack them, but to say, you give up this amount, look how much you can save of your own, as Councilor DiMartino calls it, family. Mayor Wong should know where we stand on these issues when she goes in there. And I hope she, she keeps that in her mind. But as to the cuts, yes, there is 124,000. It's not going to make a difference in terms of certification. But again, it is another avenue that we can give the mayor to decide where she wants to put it. And I will continue to suggest cuts. Public safety was my first, is my first choice. The library can be my second, but again, doesn't matter what I want. I can only recommend. So just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Tran. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Just and, um, a clarification on uh, getting a waiver. Um, did you mention that 5% within the largest department cut or 5% within the entire budget? Within the budgets of all the city departments excluding the schools. Some of those have increases. That's a negative decrease, mm -hmm. right? Okay. That would work against you to have an increase, but it would be 5% within all the other department budgets. Combined? Cuts. Right. Okay. Not Thank combined, individually. And they all have to be tabulated. It's a quite a lengthy process to apply for. And right. that is handled through uh, the auditor's office and the mayor's office. Have you gone that process yet? I have not done it. Mayor Mylot did it in 2004, and he vowed he would never <coughs> do it again. <coughs> Thank you. Mayor Long, you'd like to respond to the comments that Councilor Di Natale met? Yes. Said. Uh, <coughs> Councilor Di Natale referred a few times to, to contracts and to benefits, and also the issue of transparency. Um, I have set up a executive session meeting with the City Council, um, I believe on the 17th, um, to go over where we are. Um, coming into this, we have eight out of nine city contracts that are outstanding, including many of which have not been funded since fiscal year 2006. So the situation is not one that can be solved very easily. There are many things that we want to see happen in this room moving forward. There are past issues that we need to resolve, um, but there's also where we want to see things moving in the future. That's going to require a lot of effort, and it also requires the cooperation of people on the other side of the table, or requires arbitration in Boston or beyond. So to let the councilors know where we are, given that multiple contracts have been sent back, have been rejected by the council and sent back, um, I, f I feel it imperative to talk with the councilors to stop this cycle, to figure out if we can resolve multiple contracts going back multiple years and start figuring out how we can then proceed moving forward. I don't believe myself or the unions would want to see contracts keep going before the council and rejected. So therefore, I, I think it's in the best interest of the city if we begin to discuss where we are exactly with the contracts and what your feelings are in terms of what you're able to approve or not approve. So that's why this, I set up that meeting, so that we can actually have that very discussion that you talked about. Councilor DiMartino. Years ago, <coughs> we were three million point four in the black. <coughs> Six years later, we're in the red. It doesn't take an Einstein to know what happened. It was total mismanagement on all accounts. And anybody on the council that was on the council that time has to take a part in that responsibility. It is very difficult to say no to anybody, 
but I'm very glad to hear tonight that our mayor said it's the end of the credit card mentality because that's what we had for six years. And now everybody in this city is paying for it. The unions, the big unions that we talk about, they've done very well in the past six years. They got what they wanted. Everybody got a piece of the pie. Well, there's no pie left. I would never turn this budget back because it's not the right thing to do because the mayor gave us a balanced budget and the cuts are deep. We've all been part of the problem, but now we all have to be part of the solution. I do not intend to insult any of my colleagues, <coughs> but some people made some very bad decisions in the past six by voting on certain contracts and they all know who they are. It was not done on purpose, it was done because there was a lot of trust between the front office and this body. And tonight is one of the saddest nights because we're talking about our children and our elderly and a lot of people who use this. But we can't say, we, if we do not solve the problem of the budget of the five million this year, it will only be worse next year. We have a problem coming on next year already we have over 535 houses for sale in Fitchburg, 230 are foreclosures. We're going to lose their tax base no matter what anyone tells you. We won't be using the water and the sewer rates for those houses. We're going to lose that tax base. People may come in and ask us to reevaluate their property. We could use that tax base. The college has done very well by buying a lot of our properties but taking them off the tax rolls. We've lost that property. Our nonprofit agencies are grown because they're coming in under the assumption of an educational clause in the law. We're going to lose that. Things are going to be worse next year than this year. But the one thing I've asked everybody is let us all try to do more with less. And let's all try to see and work together. Send in a out a signal that the library is not important is really a bad signal. But in the meantime, to ask us to turn back a budget is not the way to go. I will not turn back this budget. I respect the mayor for what she has done to bring the budget to us. We're biting the bullet and everybody has to take part of this. We have great counselors. I have been so impressed tonight with every one of the people who spoke. You have a great council. It's no time to be a counselor, by the way but it's no time to be the mayor either. So please be patient with us and let us try to correct the mistakes of six years. We're not going to do them overnight. But we can survive if we all work together. <coughs> and don't fight with each other and call each other names and don't degrade each other because it doesn't help. Nobody wants their trash fee to go up. I'm not going to vote for a trash fee because I don't believe that's the way to go. Nobody wants a two and a half override because it continues the much money we get. We still spend it foolishly unless we stop the credit card mentality, which we've done this year. So please, anyone who's made mistakes in the past, they're all forgiven because it doesn't make any difference. It's over. We have nothing in the cupboard. It's bare. And what we're entitled to and what we're going to get is two different things but I would never ask this mayor to return this budget because I think for the first time in six years, I got a balanced budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Just to echo your sentiments, we will prevail. <laughs> Councillor Caddy. This is about the worst it gets, and I encourage you, please don't quit on us. You're doing, a, you're doing, you're protecting your interests, you're doing a, a great job and this is the time that we need you so please don't get discouraged and, and leave what's discouraging is that we're going to lose all our professional staff and we're, we're really not a Barnes and Noble it's not just come in and open the cash register and go uh, and that's something that we're not going to be able to uh, duplicate we're not going to be able to get people of that caliber back uh, two years three years five years how many years we're talking, I don't know. But uh, it's the livelihood of these people, but also the, uh, the involvement they have with the city. I mean, our staff has always been rated 
right up there's the most congenial, helpful people going, no matter what. Over the phone, people coming in, uh, emails, and um, that's one of the upsetting things that's going to happen. We know it. We're going to lose all of them because they can't afford to work 19 hours a week without benefits. That's, that's, we're the only department that's getting hit. I understand, but we don't quit. We don't. We don't. We, we got to get through this, and we need people like you to get through it. Thank you. Councilor DiMartino. To you, Mr. Saracen, when these people get laid off at the library, how much will it cost the city for the unemployment benefits? Um, if, if they're laid off, um, they could get approximately $15,000. It'd be like 30 weeks at about $500 a week, if the, depending on the salary. And much would that come to? Have you any idea? Um, well, 15,000 times however many people mm -hmm. did you? Um, 14. Okay, but some people may be retiring. I think we, but if There's it was. Two, two retirements. Two. So if we took uh, 15,000 times 12, I got to. $180,000. And would them, they get that 30 weeks extension that now has just come out? I'm not sure. I'd have, you know, I'm not sure what the federal guideline or rule is at this time, but I, I would have to see what the, con what the conditions are that they would have to meet. And if they find employment elsewhere, then, then we would not have to pay them any longer. They retire. Um, that helps us also. And please bear with me. I have one more question for Anne. And if I live in Fitchburg and I want to go to the Lemonster Library and I have two children, can I go over to the Lemonster Library and pay a fee for per year for my two children? And will I be allowed to go to that library? No. No. Okay. You can go there. Yeah. But you would have to use whatever they have there. Okay. Um, the decision whether to grant borrowing privileges is on an individual library by library <coughs> basis. Every Board of Trustees does consider each case individually. Um, at this point in time, Lemonster in particular has always said no to decertified libraries. We have asked for verification of that in our situation and their board will vote on this next week. But so far the indication from Lemonster, Lunenburg, Ashby, Groton, Worcester, um, Shrewsbury, I don't know, the, the uh, librarians have been just verifying with all the libraries. Uh, the answer is no. Okay, thank you very much. Any further questions on the library counselors? I realize this was a painful session for you, but I want to thank you for coming in and honestly answering the questions. Thank, thank you. you. Veteran Service Agent T.J. Blauser, thank you for being so patient and uh, welcome to your budget study session. We will discuss the Veterans Service Division, page 61 and 62. And uh, an opening statement, if you could wait just a moment till the hall is cleared. TJ, let's uh, Thank you, Mr. President. proceed with your budget. Council members, as you know, I'm the Veteran Services Agent here. We're mandated by the state to be here full time. We service the veterans of the city of Fitchburg, which is about 10% of the population. 
25% of the population is family members and other people who are affected. At this time, from the federal government, the veterans of the city of Fitchburg are receiving approximately $4 million from some of the work that we do in our office. This money goes directly to the veterans as far as disabilities, pensions, and widow's benefits. So this is part of what we do. The other portion, what we do is we give financial benefits to veterans who are in need. This is to give them some dignity rather than going down to the transitional assistance office, or yes, the transitional assistance office and asking for handouts. This is where my, my main budget line is on that. Uh, we take care of all veterans, all needs, whether it be from disabilities, information, helping to schedule rides for veterans who have dif difficulty talking to people they don't understand. Uh, on an average day, I have 15 people come into my office helping them from filling out applications, information, and other programs, and the 20 phone calls a day on the same type of things. Uh, we, we've, over the last few years, we have done and been helpful in getting many of the things done here in the city for veterans. The cannons were one of the issues that, that we fought with. They were in the library, or excuse me, in the senior center for something like 25 years. I kept pushing on that until the Rotary picked up on that, and they said they'd restore them. So we have two of our cannons. Uh, the plates up at the upper common for the World War I veterans, they were, four of them were damaged or destroyed. Through the help of another organization, we got those replaced. Uh, I worked, when I first got here, very diligently to get the clinic here to help the veterans with their medical needs so that some of them can save four, five, and six hundred dollars a month instead of on their prescriptions they go through the VA. Uh, you got Orlando Boss's proper stone up there. This last year, for anybody that came to our Patriots Day program, we got the Patriots Monument moved off the corner of Boulder and Cushing into Riverside Park under the flag. So these are some of the things that, that we do. We are looking forward to getting more area over at the Senior Center. We're looking forward to eventually getting a, an assistant. Uh, I know it's not possible at this time, but we are looking at volunteerism. We're looking at other programs where uh, college students who are veterans can donate their time and the federal government pays them money to work for us. So, but I don't have the space at this time to put one in there. I wouldn't want to have them sitting in the middle of the floor, so it would be degradating for that person. Uh, I do have a volunteer that's been coming in for the last four years. He, the only thing he has been doing is about two hours a day, he has taken all the names of all the records going back to the first militiaman was scalped up on uh, the boulder up here by an Indian. So we go from all the way back up to current veterans. We have over 21,000 names, names, addresses, when they served, and if they are deceased, that when we know of, they're when they died and where they're buried at. Um, that's many other things I do. I could go on all night saying all the little tidbits and things that I do, but I just don't want to belabor it. Uh, once again, uh, just a quick comment before questions. I, I think that uh, the you do many things with a sparse budget. And that we all know that we have to do many things with a sparse budget. Uh, well, we're all in this together, and hopefully, uh, down the road a bit, we'll we'll find ourselves in in better condition uh, as a result of the actions that the mayor and this council will be taking on this to FY09 budget. Okay, uh, I, I have one thing I wanted to mention on my budget on the telephone service that has been picked up by the IT and. It was added into my budget here, so there is an $800 amount that is an actual, I would say it's a, it was an oversight that was added into my budget. So that's also being taken out on IT. I think it's on page 23, the bottom line. But it's $720. So that is something that is able to come out of my budget. Uh, other than that, the rest of it for benefits, these are for our veterans that is mandated by the state uh, hopefully the money that we have allocated will be enough to carry us through the year. If not, we, will be, we would be back later on in time when hopefully things will be settled and look better and we could uh, effectively do some more. Councilor Joseph. 
I guess I, for one, want to commend the mayor for increasing your budget because every year that you've come in here, you have decreased your budget yourself. Um, and the health fund cash and the health fund medical is the main areas that you've gotten the increase. And it's just the amount of veterans that you're serving and the amount of services they require, it's just not going to stop. No, it isn't with the economy as it is today, with more of them getting laid off, losing their work, and coming in when they're, they've exhausted everything they can. We need to help them as much as we can, and that's why that was increased. I'm glad to see that. Councilor Boivet. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as a veteran, I, I must say that uh, 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 T.J. Blauser has helped me considerably in the past, um, and I, I truly appreciate all the help that he has given me. But f beyond beyond myself, we've got to remember that we have uh, veterans coming home on a daily basis just about from a war that we shouldn't be in, uh, and they too need services. Um, and we we would we would really be missing the boat if we didn't help help uh, the veteran service out. Thank you, Councilor Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blazer. In addition to the veterans benefits that we provide, the state and the federal government. How, how does that tie into what we provide as well? The the federal government doesn't subsidize us anything, but if I put in a claim for a veteran and he gets an award of either a disability or a pension, that goes directly to him. For anything that we do through our benefits here that you see here, we apply for reimbursement of maximum 75 percent, but that has to be awarded by the Boston office and sometimes they find things that we have to deal with. Some people aren't eligible and we've done it. Uh, but we try and get to 75 percent of that, which comes back to us, I believe, and that's, what, a year and a half to two years, Dick? Yeah, about 18 months. Yeah. yeah, two years. A year and a half. Thank, thank you very much. Th thank you. Councilor Martino. I just want to thank you for doing a wonderful job. And um, you don't seem to ever make any noise or say anything, and you're not out there waving the flag, so to speak, for... Basically, I want you to know that all the people that I've sent to you, you have helped them tremendously. And I know that these are difficult times and people are coming to you for more, including for food. And it's a very difficult time for our veterans. And I'm glad that you're there. We have made an association with two different organizations locally that will give food out, but they have to come through me to, to verify that they actually are qualified. So there is some organizations that one of them gives it out monthly and the other one will give it out, I think, every two weeks, a box of food. It's very sad that it has come to that for our veterans. Thank you very much. Other questions of Mr. Blazer? <coughs> I'd just like to thank you for all you do for the veterans as well. I think people who are, serve our country need all the help that they can get when they ask for it. We wouldn't be sitting here tonight if it wasn't for a veteran. Thank you. Uh, one other thing I'd like to point out, I, because of my military association, retired from military, I do not use any of the medical benefits, which is a savings to the city of, I, I don't know what it is, but that's something that I have never used in the city in the 12 years that I've been employed here. So in my own way, I give a little bit extra to make sure that things get done. Thank you. Very good point. Thank you very much, Mr. Blaza. Thank you. <laughs> Councilors, our next budget session will be Tuesday, June 10th, immediately following the Finance Committee, which begins at 730. Second. Motion made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye.